Good evening, everyone. This is a special meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, September 28, 2020, at 7.02 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is also being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downers Grove YouTube channel, and the recording will be posted on District 58's YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchik. Here. Member Samanti. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. District 58 recently lost a valued staff member in Amy Esposito, Secretary at Indian Trail. She passed away peacefully at home with her family at her side on Thursday, September 17, 2020, after a battle with breast cancer. Amy was a beloved member of the District 58 school community. Her children attended Lester Elementary and Herrick Middle School. She worked at Highland School as an office clerk before accepting the position of Secretary at Indian Trail School. Amy will be greatly missed by her District 58 family. We would like to observe a moment of silence in her memory. Thank you. This evening, members of the community will have an opportunity to share a public comment with the board later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the basket on the table over to my right. Members of the public who are viewing remotely may provide a public comment by calling 630-743-4085 and recording their comment. Comments will be accepted until we reach the public comment portion of the agenda. We will play all comments submitted remotely in the order in which they were received. I have allotted 60 minutes for public comment, up to three minutes each. Should there be any time remaining, we will take any additional in-person questions. Let's start off today with the flag salute and the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> All right, first on tonight's agenda is the public hearing on the proposed 2020 through 2021 legal budget. Please welcome Mr. Todd Drayfall. Good evening. I first want to thank the board for arranging and putting in a special meeting uh, as we adjust our budget cycle a little bit uh, different than we normally do. Um, in the past, normally by now this would have been approved given our circumstances. We've delayed the initial presentation of the budget to the end of August uh, and pushed it to the final uh, week here in September. Um, this is the final uh, step in a process that essentially started last October. When the board receives its initial uh, tax levy projection uh, report in October uh, and then an approval in November, that really starts the next budget cycle uh, as that is the large section of our revenue. Uh, December through January, uh, administrative staff and, and team work through uh, updates and plans and projections and models. Uh, we then work through with uh, staff throughout the year. Obviously, when we get into March, the board makes some decisions on staffing, and you know, we have a, a budget or a finance worksheet work report in April. Um, that has been the format, and so this is, albeit the, the slides that are tonight, um, maybe a little longer than normal final presentations, uh, just a, a summary of all of that work uh, as a completion piece. There is also, for those watching and watch the presentation, a memo that goes into a little more detail about impact of budget and, and some of the issues with this budget in the, uh, in the board book. And I would recommend reading that and going through that. It isn't as long as it looks. There's graphs and, and charts and things to, to break it up a little bit, but it, it goes into a little more detail uh, than what we might do in the presentation. 
So as with any budget, we start with the mission and vision. That is our foundation of our planning and our processes. And we continually go back to those as we build a budget or a spending plan as to how that's going to implement. We have our securing the future strategic plan that the district developed several years ago. And in that goal three is ensuring the avail availability of resources necessary to reinvigorate and sustain district facilities, support quality programming, and attract and retain highly effective staff to meet the needs of all students. <clears throat> this evening, the budget, and this is a continuation slide from last month, is to our goal for this budget, and even as we talk about going on after the fiscal year 21, and what we are planning and working through for the next couple of years, and namely looking into fiscal year 22, um, is navigating through the pandemic, providing consistent services for students and staff, and managing the deficit. This is uh, the, the plan and the, the, prod, or the budget, as the board is aware, um, the district is in a deficit position for this year. Uh, we did trim it from its initial presentation uh, a month ago, uh, but it is still a significant issue, and we'll talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> I wanted to kind of, and again, this is as much for people watching as it is for the board. The board is more aware of these things than most. Uh, our budget, our revenue by source is about $71 million this year. A good portion of the majority of that is, comes from property taxes. We show this pie graph because one of the pieces we want to point out is we're very fortunate in Downers Grove uh, in that 17% of our revenue stream comes from non-residential property taxes. We have a strong commercial base and that does help in managing both the tax rate uh, for community, but also for the amount of resources that come in from non-residential or non-user areas. So we wanted to make sure to point that out piece. But again, as you can see, the majority of our funding is, is property tax based. Uh, that is the case in DuPage County in the state of Illinois. Um, you know, the, the state has a smaller portion uh, of funding Additionally, for the state this year, uh, the state aid was held harmless and kept at the same level it was the previous year. It had been growing 1 or 2 percent. Now, that total is only $3.3 .3 million. Other pieces of the state funding comes from reimbursements from the prior year's expenses. Those are usually prorated at a lesser percentage depending upon on what the state has and what it appropriates for those reimbursements. One of the areas that we'll talk about a little bit is some of our reduction in revenue is based on a reduction last year in transportation. Having the last 50 days of school and not being uh, in school and being remote, we did not have uh, our transportation bill was down over a million dollars. That translates into a smaller reimbursement into this next fiscal year from the state. <clears throat> So even though it was $71 million, uh, last year our budget was 73.6. Our actual receipts were 71.7. As you can see, we have, uh, we have a budget loss of about 3.6% uh, or $2.6 million. The majority of that comes from local fees. One is the Oak Keep fee, the tuition structure for kindergarten that we have for that second half of the day. Other re reductions in uh, tuition, bus fees that aren't collected, student registration fees that are down, um, you know, that is a big piece. Transportation reimbursement is noted in there and that's because of that expenditure as we talked about. <clears throat> Other areas that we have reductions that is important to us, and when you talk about a $71 million budget, you may go, well, that's not, you know, the interest income and the CPPRT total is $250,000 as a percentage, is, not, is a small piece of the budget. 
But $250,000 is still a lot of teachers, a lot of people. Um, it's, you know, it, it's, it's an area. And it's important because those are areas that are likely not going to become back right away um, over the next year or so. Interest income is that money that we can invest. We have a very small level of what we can invest in um, with the funds that we have on, on hand. Uh, we invest in very secure uh, investments so that they come back. And with the federal interest rate uh, down to almost zero, uh, that translates into a very small investment return for the district. Corporate personal property replacement tax is a long term for what is essentially a corporate tax that was put in place in the 1970 Constitution to replace corporate personal property. Um, it's about $800,000, $900,000 a year that the district receives through the state. Uh, that is down from last year by $130,000. That is dependent upon on a good economy and corporate, and corporate taxes. So depending on what that is and how that will be, we were able to put back a little bit from our initial projections uh, in this piece, but it's still down from last year, $130,000. Expenditure report, I threw this up there because I wanted, it, it graphs off, numbers can, you, you can look at numbers and see them, but when you look at them in a picture, it gives a much clearer sense as to the impact on your expense and on your salary, on your budget, you know, as to what objects um, drive it. No surprise, we're a, we're a service industry. Um, the majority of our expenses are in programs that are, are run by staff. And so the majority of our expenditures comes from salaries and benefits. And you can see that that is where you know, those, those expenses go. Additionally, there's another piece in this. And as we get into planning for fiscal year 22 and our fiscal planning for the next year, we will bring the board more information about our capital fund and capital expenditures comparative to some of our neighbors. But you can see that that is a percentage and it, it is a very low number. And when we built Leicester a couple of years ago, obviously it was a $3 million over a year or two. But by and large, our expenditure, our investment in infrastructure over many years has been uh, much smaller than what we need to for the size and, and the age of our buildings. So that is something we want to talk about going forward. <clears throat> at a glance, one of the things we were able to do when we went back through is we made some adjustments from that initial budget to bring down uh, some expenses, to bring down some of that deficit. Uh, now, we also had to bring down some, ex some revenues. We had to make some adjustments because as, you know, as in with anything from the initial presentation to the final, you know, as... Uh, Things become more clear, we sharpen the pencil up, and we adjust on both sides of the ledger. Uh, so we did have some reductions in, in revenues on uh, this year, or this budget versus the, the presentation budget. On the expense side, we're able to bring in, where operationals or expenses are less than 1% above where the fiscal year 21's, I'm sorry, fiscal year 20's budget. Uh, we have, there are positions and things that were added through the year uh, and adjustments made uh, that were presented to the board uh, through the spring, those are still in there. Transportation is still at about 98% of last year's budget, assuming the increased rates that we have for the contract for this year versus last, as well as the adjustment of days in and out um, of, um, of on-site uh, tr you know, in, in the needs for transportation. Medical insurance is estimated at two and a half percent increase. Uh, and as we've said to the board before, there's the health and wellness committee uh, that has all representative of all of the uh, bargaining units. They meet monthly. They will be meeting again next month and bring a recommendation to the board for that uh, renewal 
and that will be effective for January 1st. We have gone through and made some reductions in areas we know looking at this next year, we, being that this is not a normal year, uh, that we don't see expending. Reductions in overtime, substitute pay. Uh, we have substitutes for when people are sick. We also have substitutes for when people aren't doing professional development. And given the structure and where we're looking at, we know that there's going to be some reductions in some of those things that may happen through this next year. And so looking at that, what we can bring those down. As well as instructional assistance uh, and where we're at currently with staffing and where we need, uh, you know, for the going forward versus where we had budgeted originally or where we had ended in last year at fiscal, tw at fiscal year 20. Those big, those pieces are a large <coughs> adjustment uh, to the budget that help bring down the deficit. There's obviously increases in operational and maintenance for the items that we've purchased, um, required the tents, rental of the storage containers, PPE, cleaning supplies, uh, and all of those items that are needed, as well as increases in contract services as we look at snow, replay, snow removal, possibility of having to do and outsource more landscaping uh, so that our custodians can make sure they concentrate on the cleaning of the buildings. <clears throat> there is one thing in the capital piece, and as we continually work with the state on the El Sierra Playground Grant, um, as the board's aware, uh, the district did receive funding for playgrounds uh, from the state. Uh, there was a prioritization of this money, and this is bond money that the state has sitting for these purposes. Uh, the state grant process is a long and slow <laughs> process uh, that has also uh, been exacerbated by, by the pandemic and the lack of, I think, technology that the staff have at the state at home sometimes to go through the, the process. But we're continually working with them and hope to have that done in this fiscal year, um, hopefully soon. Uh, we had some uh, documents for the Department of National Resource, uh, Resources that had to be approved to make sure that what we're doing is, you know, that there's not endangerment of things and so forth. All of the standard boilerplate stuff for the state. So we continue to work on that, and that is in the budget and the capital fund. <clears throat> I want to just briefly look at kind of a table to get a sense of some of the reduction piece in uh, education fund salaries. So in fiscal year 20, our spend for full full time salaries in the education fund was $39.3 million. Our budget for this year is 39.8, 1.4% change. Uh, obviously in that piece there's been some reductions to accommodate that piece. There are contract increases um, for all, all staff each year. Um, teachers go in a step process. Obviously, you know, those who are working through uh, graduate work may make a lane jump and so forth, and all of that is accounted for. Additionally, reductions, as you can see in the sub and stipends. Uh, we have adjusted and removed some things uh, in there. Uh, outdoor education is one of those pieces. Um, it doesn't mean that we can't put some of these things back. Remember, this is a spending plan and a structure we have at this time. If things evolve and change in the spring and we're able to do some of the things that we may not have accounted for today but can bring in and oftentimes outdoor education when we take the expenditure of those items there's also a revenue piece that's a that's a a net zero neutral plan because we have revenue that offsets we remove both of those right now if for some reason we're able to do that in the future in the spring we certainly can go and adjust that um, and if we have to amend the budget you know, the board can do so before the end of the fiscal year. Uh, but given where we're looking at today, you know, we've removed the, you know, the field trips and the outdoor education pieces and, and those expenditures that we see um, in the budget. 
just given where we are today. Overall, um, we are spending pretty much what we spent. We're budgeting what we've spent in salaries in the education fund in fiscal year 20. <clears throat> in the packet, in the back of the budget, you have the recap. This is our standard recap form uh, that the board sees uh, often with the budget process. You have the beginning balance of the budget, uh, the revenues by source, by fund, and expenditures by object. And um, you can go pull those up in the board docs uh, to look at it fully on your screens um, so as not to squint. But at the end of the day, our deficit for operating funds for non-capital is about $1.6, $1.66 million. Overall, when you add the capital in, understanding that there are some capital projects that cross fiscal years. Um, for example, the playgrounds that we received revenue for the Lester playground and for the Puffer playground, those actually didn't finish until this fiscal year, but the revenue was in last fiscal year. So you'll see those, that, you know, the expense will be out in this fiscal, but we already had uh, those expense, th those, those revenues and resources in. So that jumps it up to about 1.8. So we've kind of gone through why we have a deficit. In essence, um, it's a largely revenue-driven piece, um, but and, and we have made attempts and work through to adjust expenditures as best we can. There are increased expenditures. We have increased expenditures for COVID, as we've talked about in the operation and maintenance. Some of those are one-time expenses. Buying tents and then renting some, um, we now own those. The containers, hopefully eventually we'll, at the end of the year, we'll not need those. Um, the cleaning equipment, though we bought things and we own those now, the increase in cleaning supplies is likely not going to go away. I don't think anyone thinks that the sanitation structure that we have in place today is going to leave us any time in the next couple fiscal years. I think we, we, we work with and assume that that is going to be our, our modus operandi for a while. Um, I always go back to 9-11 and when my wife used to travel all the time and I would always meet her at the gate when I would pick her up on Fridays when she would be flying home and after 9-11 I just drive up. Saved on the parking, but there was a fundamental shift and change that we are now used to and do all the time. There are certain pieces of this that I think we're going to be into that we're not going to see. Yeah, we're going to have, I think, in the operations and maintenance area and in cleaning, that's going to be one of them. And so we need to plan and adjust budgeting going forward for those. So we'll go through. Short term, what we have for the long term, and then our mid term, and then our long term, looking at how we're going to manage and work through uh, these pieces. Borrowing. As the board is aware, the district, though it ends the year with a strong fund balance because of the early tax money that comes in in the last 30 days, understand that 40 plus percent of our, of our annual revenue comes in in the last 30 days of the fiscal year. That means that the, the district has to have funds on hand through that year to cover all of those bills. Routinely, the district has, before those early tax receipts come in, um, about a million dollars uh, in the bank. Uh, last, this last year, uh, on Friday, we had a million dollars. Payroll was due the next Friday. Payroll gets charged on Wednesday. That payroll is $2 million. You can do the math, that's pretty simple. Fortunately, the Monday before, the Monday before that Wednesday, $12 million or $8 million was deposited from those early property tax receipts from the county clerk's office. Uh, that's, a, that's a position as a financial person we don't really want to be into. <laughs> 
Um, and we are very cognizant of that calendar. If that calendar adjusts in any way, or we see that there's a potential, we need to have that two plus million dollars to cover that payroll. Um, so that means we need to look at ways that we can do some short-term borrowing. Uh, there are several options. Um, traditionally, when districts, when, when units of government have to go into a short-term borrowing, they're able to do things called tax, anticip tax anticipation warrants. Um, they borrow them. They issue the warrants. The board has to approve them. Um, we receive the money, hold on to it, use it when we need to, and as soon as the taxes come in, um, we pay back that money. Um, that is likely something we would have to do for a 30-day period. Um, the interest rate is very low on that money right now. The legal bill will probably exceed the interest charges for that uh, because you have to have a legal opinion. We, you know, if there's some work to it. Um, we are looking at some other ways that we can do some things with the bank if we need to, um, depending on the district's directive and our plans and how we work for, uh, because one of the things we'll need to talk about is capital, and that is if we're looking at doing some work and issuing some debt to try to, to handle and manage some of our smaller capital projects next summer, that may be an opportunity uh, to receipt that money uh, early on and have that available for that purpose. Certainly, you know, once the tax receipts come in, that money goes back into the working cash fund and then is used for that capital project. The other piece, the one positive, um, the district has a self-insurance medical reserve fund. It has um, in a better position than it's been in many years. Uh, due to rate increases and certainly not having a lot of use right now uh, as people avoid uh, certain procedures and so forth. And so there is possible that that could have that money available if necessary for a week's time uh, if the district would need some. And that would have a zero cost to it because it would be a transfer back and forth. Either way, those are options that we have. We continue to watch that. It's not something we have to make any decisions on today um, or even in the next month or so, but it is something that's available. This chart can look a little confusing, so I'm going to walk through it. We talked about the adjustments and the savings and what we did to reduce to bring the deficit down. We cut between you add all of those stipends, subpay, and positions, about $1.3 million out of what would have been fiscal year 20 level of programming and, and, and structure. We also have a reduction in transportation costs of about a half a million dollars, or that would go forward into fiscal year 22. That's $1.8 million. So if we were to say, in fiscal year 22, come back to fiscal year 20 as is. Not that we ever do that. We always are making adjustments and there's always changes and things where that our you know, curriculum needs and so forth. But if we were to do that at that level, that's a $1.8 million increase to this year's budget. Add the deficit piece into that. Subtract whether it's not doing the OKEEP program or doing the OKEEP program and bringing the revenue that offsets. That's a million dollars, so we subtract that off of those numbers. That leaves going into 22 with about a two and a half million dollar challenge, opportunity, concern, position that we have to, to address as we move into fiscal year 22. When you look at the operating revenue for this year, it's about three and a half percent of the operating revenue. And a little text box up there talks a little bit about the tax levies. The tax levies are those taxes that the board approves. Um, it is collected in the property taxes. We split each tax levy covers half of a fiscal year. So one half goes to one year, one half goes to the next. Uh, the tax levy that the board will approve 
uh, in November for collection in the spring and next fall has a CPI of 2.3%. That's how we're able to increase revenue and so forth. We estimate that we will receive an additional $1.75 million. Understand that it gets half into each fiscal year. The following year, we have a TIF that comes off downtown TIF. After 23 years, the district will be able to access the property, tax the, the real estate property in downtown that adds uh, a piece that allows the district to increase. That's about $1.8 million. Now, the important piece is we don't know what the CPI will be because we won't know for that next year. That's, that's the levy that you're going to look at in November of 21. The CPI is the change in December, the change in December. We find out what that is in January. Um, if that is lower than 1%, um, that is going to have an impact on what we have available for resources. One of the things that the district has been looking at for planning and programming, again, for its capital and infrastructure issues, is working to come up with a way to earmark or to focus on some of those revenues coming in from the TIF to help address some of those shortcomings that we have in infrastructure. This, uh, the pandemic and the economy that is driven uh, right now where we're at puts that into a jeopardy, into a position that we're going to have an issue with. And remember, I have that $250,000 in lost revenue uh, in the interest income in CPPRT. If those don't, you know, those are not going to, if we project that those aren't going to be coming back uh, into 22 or are stagnant at all, we won't have those, those monies available to us. Um, we don't have it in here, but one of the issues is that we're always looking at is the condition of what the state is at. The state has held harmless or frozen uh, evidence-based funding formula um, for all districts this last year so that we knew we were going to get our funding as we did previously. We don't know how long that will last or what the state will be in a position and be able to do. So how do we manage going forward? So one of the models, one of the things we were working on is going through a process and immediately starting, essentially we're starting the fiscal year 22 budget upon approval of the fiscal year 21, uh, and coming back with our financial workshop in December uh, with plans and designs, we'll talk about that in a minute as to how, what that framework is. But creating a structure that we, the board adopts in the spring of each year, a three-year financial plan. Now, the district does see, and the board sees it uh, annually, a five-year projection model. We use that. We have software that does that, and, and that's kind of how we, we function and look to see, because we certainly don't want to start a program that we can't long-term fund. Um, that's why we use those, those tools and those models. But this is a little bit more of a formal process to that, where the board is going to, we lay out uh, things that we already have developed, the curriculum, update plan, technology plan and cycle, um, staffing structure as we are for the next fiscal year. Put that into one document for the, for the board to approve each year, every year. And that is what we base our budget on going forward. Uh, it's a more, as I said, a, more, a little more formal process we work in the capital needs and address. And so you're addressing and talking about all of those issues in one document uh, each year into the spring. And you do that early enough um, in, the, in the cycle so that the board has some ability to make some decisions that will impact the next fiscal year. So going into the financial workshop in December, we have initial project you know, plans and projections for 22 with revenue. And as we always say, the earlier they are, the more conservative they're going to be, not knowing what the future looks like. That's just kind of how um, business managers keep their jobs usually is not being too out of the line on the revenue side. Um, but that is also just good practice and best, 
best thinking on that. We do initial planning for that. We do some curriculum update, calendaring, some, and, some, and a look at capital, and working through those options and start looking at ways that we can and areas that we can focus on or at least throw out some ideas for the board to consider and the community to consider. Uh, and that December piece really starts that process in, in motion. From there, you know, so looking at those, some of the recomm you know, not rec <coughs> recommendations moving forward, potential of a, of a revenue, of a, of a referendum. Um, the district has talked about but moving forward with what is the long term and how do we move off of the current structure with Longfellow and its two system format of two buildings and central administration and support and having a, a, an asset that has value outside of district ownership um, and moving that off. Reconfiguration of facilities, looking at uh, ways that maybe there's a way of looking at attendance boundaries and the structures of that. Uh, reviewing capital and prioritizing capital needs and infrastructure. One of the things that uh, operations maintenance are going to be bringing to the board in short order is the need for a new roof at Pierce Downer. And because it's failing. And we have some asphalt work. And is there some lighting projects that we can do that has some very quick return on investment or some boilers that we're spending operational dollars every year maintaining and keeping up that are extraordinarily inefficient. We had held off on those as we were going through that referendum process and that master facility planning um, that essentially stopped March 12th. And is, you know, so that, you know, the conversation of does that start again or are we looking for some other options and how we may do some of those things to, to start moving those pieces forward. And I was thinking, you know, um, as the board is aware, we have a financial advisory committee uh, that makes recommendations, uh, members of the community, um, and going through, and, and they have been engaged through this process, and we'll continually work with them about some cash management and positioning and fund balance pieces, because we certainly need to manage what we have available and resources on a daily basis, so that we're not in the position of having a million dollars and a $2 million payroll and trying to figure out how to, how to make sure we cover that. <clears throat> but one of the pieces is, certainly this is not an administrative decision piece. This is where we engage a community um, into this process. And uh, fortunately, all of the work that the district's done through the strategic plan, the master facility planning, um, and having that citizens task force that had already been in existence uh, and working and is up to date on, or is as up to date as February, but current on those issues and needs of the district um, and bringing them back in and, and working with them as we go through that process and starting in December making in some of those pieces. So January coming up with the, and then this is just kind of going through the cycle, you know, January putting together the three-year tech and curriculum planning, you know, reviews options by the Citizens Task Force, February, you know, looking at staffing for, for 22. Uh, again, continually, obviously, updating revenue uh, projections and what we have available um, and options. And then coming back in March, looking at approval for staffing for 22, um, balancing budget and projections in a model for 23 to 24. I think I've pretty much covered this. Obviously, this is a big piece that we want to make sure we take in as much feedback as possible through the community and wanting to do it in a format. Um, so we're looking at how we're going to prioritize these pieces and what we can do uh, to manage uh, needs, expectations, and resources. With that, I will take questions. Thank you very much. It's a point of order. Um, where are we on the agenda? Are we in the public hearing? Have we oh, that's right. We're in the public hearing. Yeah. So have, do we need to convene that through board action? Yes. But we're just Thank not you. there yet. This is an opportunity. We will open so, it up. So we're going right to ask this. questions, public hearing, then we're going to. And then um, we'll do that. Right. Right. Then we're going to 
put then, a motion into adopt the budget for more discussion. Yes. Okay, do you want to kill two birds with one stone and have all the discussion at that point in the agenda? Uh, whatever. Yeah. I'll, if anyone's I'll, got a question, go ahead. I'll throw, I'll throw, I don't have now. a question. Yeah. Um, I just have a, a statement. Um, I, you know, I just want to show appreciation and, and respect to uh, Todd and to Kevin. This is, you, you guys have done a, a nice job with a terrible hand that, that was dealt to you, um, and that I, I have much appreciation for that. Um, I, that's, it, this is um, extraordinarily challenging for the district, and um, certainly there's a lot of hard work ahead of us. And um, I just, uh, I, there's so, so many questions, but there's so many unknowns. So um, I would just say that we just need to make sure that we are engaged in the community effectively. I really like what you said about, um, about Citizens Task Force. To Citizens Task Forces, and we all know all the challenges we face. We know that money is, is, is certainly a problem, and we're going to need um, to um, have these, these really hard conversations now and regularly in order to get through what's not just a problem for this year, but is going to be many, many, many years down the road. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Comments, questions? I did just want to take a minute and um, and say how really important it is. Normally, your, your presentation on this final part of it isn't quite so extensive. I think in my notes here it says, introduce for a brief comment. <laughs> um, so, which is normally, uh, normally how it would go. But I, I, I wanted to take a moment and reflect how important that, that three-year look is really going to be. I think that so much of what we've talked about is the impact that this has had on this fiscal year and on what we're doing now, but it really does have a long-term impact. And when you hear terms like held harmless, that implies that it's, that it's harmless. But, but when you have pre-contracted increases and stuff, and every year in every contract that we have in this district, staying flat is not necessarily harmless. And when you're talking about a, a, a CPI potentially below 1%, this can have, you know, that, that's an exponential issue as, as we move forward. It, it compounds. So I, I'm looking forward to reconvening the Citizens Task Force, the conversations that happen in that that room may be more around um, finding ways to cut costs as opposed to finding ways to generate revenue. Hopefully there's a way to do both, but, um, but I look forward to getting them back together. Thank you for the hard work, and I, and I know we're literally going to start talking about fiscal year 22 um, in our next meeting, so uh, th th thanks, thanks again. Mm -hmm. All right. At this time, I declare that the hearing op is open to allow members of the audience to comment on this topic. Anyone wishing to be heard, please step up to the podium, state your name, attendance area, and organization, if any, for the record. Okay. How are we doing? Is, are we allowing anybody to phone in? Yeah, do, do we have, a, are any of the comments that came in, James, um, regarding budget? They are not. Okay, thank you. All right, since there are no comments tonight, I now declare this hearing officially closed at 7.45 uh, p.m. Okay. Having prepared a tentative budget and having made same conveniently available for the public inspection for at least 30 days prior to the public hearing, and further having considered input and made adjustments to the tentative budget, is there a motion to adopt the 2020 through 2021 legal budget as presented in final form? So moved. Second. Any discussion? <coughs> All right, Melissa, please call roll. You did? Really quick. Okay. Um, just, to, just to add on, I, I was um, just wanted to add to the what I said earlier that we have um, over the last several months, we've had um, several board meetings on, on our return to learn plan, and they've been super important, and we've seen um, a huge level of engagement from the community in, in that issue. Um, we've, we've received hundreds of public comments. We've received hundreds of emails. Each of us individually has probably spent dozens of hours just talking to friends and neighbors, um, and, and, and rightly so. Um, we haven't heard a single comment from anybody anywhere in our community on our budget, and I think this is, um, this is just, not, I mean, I'm supporting it because I know this is the most unusual of years. Um, this is um, scary. I think I'm, I'm concerned that, that we are 
um, kind of there's so, so much maybe it's because so much attention has been, uh, been paid to COVID we're kind of just letting this one slide this is cat this is a, a huge catastrophe the COVID thing has been really bad for our community but this is just as bad for our school district and I, I just feel like we need to do a really good job of uh, like I was saying getting out there and talking to our community about this a 1.6 plus million dollar deficit is um, frightening to me and um, as, as my uh, former colleague John Miller used to say federal government can print money but school districts cannot. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna to have to have many hard conversations as a board this year and, and future fiscal years, three, five years down the line, about how to recover from this. And I'm just, anybody who's in the audience tonight and anybody who's listening to us at home, I'm really encouraging you and, and begging you, like really asking very strongly to stay engaged on this, keep following this. This is something that we need to um, respond to as a community. It's not something, it's not work that can get done with just the seven people up here in our administration. This is something that we all need to kind of rally around our schools for because it's going to take a very long time to recover for this. Since I've been on the board for the last three and a half years, I have always been concerned about our finances. We have the smallest fund balances, not, not, as, not um, as an amount, but as a, a percentage of our budget. We have the smallest fund balances of elementary districts in DuPage County. So we are not, we are not one of the haves in terms of school districts. So this, um, with our OK problem, and the, the $900,000 to $1 million that we're losing in revenue because we're not offering O'Keefe this year, we are faring this way worse than most other school districts. This is, um, this is a challenge that is not unique to 58, but it's certainly gonna be felt here worse than many of our surrounding neighborhoods and, neighbor, and, and communities and school districts. So I'm just, um, again, showing support for the administration in, in a very unusual time but urging, urging everybody in the community to keep following this. This is going to be, um, um, a, 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 the passing of this budget is going to be something that's gonna reverberate through this community for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Vice President Harris. You're, you're absolutely correct. This is gonna be something that we feel for a long time. Uh, any other comments or questions? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the 2020 through 2021 legal budget. We have one discussion item tonight. It is our return to learn plan for the uh, for 2020 through 2021. Uh, we'd like to welcome up to the podium, Dr. Russell. Well, I'd like to thank the board uh, for having another discussion on a return to learn plan. I also want to thank, we have many staff members in the audience, so thank you uh, for not only being here this evening, but for your long hours. I also know we have uh, several parents in the audience and, and listening in at home. You know, we talk about 2020, those three words, patience, grace, and flexibility. And one of the things that I'm extremely proud of is that patience, grace, and flexibility that we've all shown uh, toward one another uh, since July. And I would love to stand up here tonight and tell you that this is all over and things can get back to normal, uh, but I can't do that uh, this evening. But I do think we're taking uh, some positive steps in our recommendation uh, this evening. Know that what you're about to see on the slides, like many things with COVID and the reopening of schools, will make some people ecstatic. It will also make some people very angry. It will leave others with many questions. Uh, as an administration, we are committed to not only working with our staff, but our families and all stakeholders, especially our students, to make sure that we continue to prioritize uh, their safety, their instruction, so we can get the best product that our students deserve. As you see the presentation tonight, I do wanna remind the board how we went about this and, and how we prioritize this. First and foremost, when you're dealing with COVID-19, obviously health and safety is number one. That is always the biggest priority. So the decisions and recommendations that we're gonna talk about tonight really come from that lens. What are the experts telling us we can do and what are the experts telling us we cannot do? The next thing we're going at this presentation in terms of priorities is trying to maximize in-person instruction. I think our district did a great job last spring. I think we are hitting it out of the park in terms of remote learning right now. But as your superintendent, this is certainly a subjective opinion, 
I don't think anything holds a candle to in-person instruction, especially when you're talking about uh, young children. And so prioritizing in-person instruction is the second thing that we want to focus in on. The next thing that we want to focus in on is how do we minimize educational disruptions? And, and that is a challenge, it really is, because when you looked at our mission and vision in Todd's presentation, we talked about creating quality educational opportunities. And there are certainly th things we can do as a district to just throw a camera in the back of the classroom and things like that, that would certainly make things easier. But it wouldn't necessarily give us those quality educational opportunities for our children. So the whole disruption piece is another big thing uh, that we want to uh, take a look at. So some of our other objectives tonight, we want to provide the board as promised with an update on neighboring districts and we'll expand that uh, throughout the Chicagoland area. We're going to make recommendations on what a return for on-site instruction can look like, um, including instructional models for our elementary and our middle school. And we will parse those two out this evening because they are two very different things. Uh, we want to give you a timeline for a recommended implementation, provide you with an overview of transportation and an explanation of what the commitment process will look like for our family. So a deadline for a decision and then a timeline for the next phase. So one of the most common questions I've been getting is why now? Why can we return students on site now where a month ago we weren't able uh, to do that and then two months ago we thought we were able to do that. As we know over the summer the guidance changed and it switched and it became more stringent and things became very cloudy so to speak. In my view as the superintendent we have a much clearer picture than we had in August. The guidance has been updated uh, from not only the IDPH, but the real big thing that's helped us out a lot as a school district in DuPage County is the health department's return to school framework. That has really been a lifesaver for us. If you remember, the IDPA met or IDPH metrics came out, it was very confusing and, and tough to interpret, but those really helped us. Uh, we've also reviewed uh, the other assessment criteria. We have had a week of uh, transition learning where students were on site. We learned a great deal from that week. Um, and then also, we have on-site instruction going on right now in District 58. We have our specialized programs up and running. I want to compliment Jessica Stewart and her team for all the work that they're doing. We're bringing other students with special needs back this week. And so there's a lot of really good things that we're learning from. I'm not going to say it's easy. Uh, in fact, it's very challenging, but it's worth it. So again, just a, a quick overview. We've been over this slide many times, um, but you know, we talked a great deal over the summer. What are we looking at? What, what are things that we're going to assess? And so here are some of the things that we talked about. We talked about the health department indicators. We talked about staffing. We talked about can we get clear guidance that can be interpreted by our local health department and the implementation of that guidance. So what's the disruption to the educational process? Is it too costly? Now, we're not just talking in terms of finances there, but we're talking about institutional capacity. And sometimes you have to ask yourself is, if we do this, what is that going to do to our institution? And, and so those are things that we're looking at. So just a quick overview of the guidance. We know that we're looking really from three governmental agencies as we look at this. Um, I know I get a lot of parents who send me things from the CDC or the American uh, Association of Pediatrics, but, but really as a public school district in Illinois, this is what we're looking at. We're looking at what the state board shares with us, and what they share with us is any plan that we have to have has to be five hours of instruction. They're strongly recommending two and a half hours of synchronous instruction, whether that's direct through Zoom or, or another teleconferencing uh, app, or they're in person. And then through Governor Pritzker's um, order, we have a lot of variety of instructional options that we can take a look at. In terms of IDPH, we know they've given us metrics. Um, masks are required, social distancing is required, self-certification is required, and then transportation. They have some rules around transportation um, that can often be confusing and we'll take a look at what those look like. And then of course the health department. The health department in DuPage County has been our guiding light through this whole thing and something we're very grateful for in DuPage County. Um, they have finally put together a return to school framework because the state didn't come up with one and that's really again instrumental in helping us make some of these decisions. So what does this framework look like? I talked a lot about this at the September meeting. I'll repeat some of it tonight. 
Please don't confuse this with the Illinois Department of Public Health, their orange and blue distinctions. That's a completely different thing. So right now we know our county is an orange, Will County was an orange, now they're blue. That's different um, from what we're looking at. We're looking at transmission levels in DuPage County. There are two sites I'd invite people to look at. The DuPage County Health Department site has a really good um, site where you can look at COVID by zip code, and you can type in the two downers grove zip codes and get the number of cases. Northwestern University is also provided what I think is a, a very in-depth website that we take a look at a lot. And there, you're not only looking at the number of cases, but you can combine both Downers Grove zip codes and Woodridge in there as well, what, however you want to do it. And it gives you the rolling positivity rate. So you can take a look inside of our school district to see how it's impacting us. Now, a word of caution with that, remember not all of our employees live here in the two Downers Grove zip codes. So you have to kind of take some of that with a grain of salt as you're looking at it. That's why we tend to look at things from a county level. Oh, hold on, James, sorry about that. So when we look at the three transmission levels, minimal, when they, when they came out with this, and, um, and this was after we had made our summer recommendations, minimal allows you to do a lot more things in my view. It allows you to have things um, like passing periods and lunches, and you, you can move around a lot. You still have to wear masks and do the six feet of social distancing. We are nowhere close to minimal right now in DuPage County. We're in what's called moderate. And we are right on that line between moderate and substantial. And what moderate is encouraging the learning models from the health department is some people learn at school and some people learn at home. So what does that mean? We're effectively talking about hybrid models there where you have a reduced population in your schools. It's also talking about minimal to no movement when you're in schools and cohorting kids together. Why would we want to cohort students together? If you do have a positive case, it makes it much more manageable to deal with when you're dealing with a cohort of people rather than mixing the masses together. One of the things the health department has shared with us why social distancing and mask wearing is really helpful. When you start to mix masses of people together, some of those things are less effective with the more people that you have in a space. So that's where cohorting and, and, and some of that uh, no to minimal mixing. It, I don't think you can ever have a situation in a school where you're not moving at some point during the day. It's how do you minimize that um, to the greatest extent possible. And then of course substantial is where they're suggesting you do 100% remote learning. Now this is one of many assessment criteria that we look at. So it's not the only thing that we look at, but it is the common lens that we can look at as a county and all the other superintendents and school boards can take a look at in terms of how we move forward. So again, we're right between moderate and substantial. Thanks, James. <laughs> so I want to review now some of these different metrics. We just looked at the return to learn we shared what we've been dealing with in District 58, and this is in line with some of the other districts and what we're seeing. We've had two positive staff cases um, prior to the start of uh, transition week. We've also had one positive, or positive student case after the transition day, so that student was, on, was not on site when we had that. So we're seeing very few positive cases in our school district, and I think that aligns with what you're seeing across other school districts, but there aren't zero, uh, but it is a very small number. Um, during the transition days, this is what we saw. Now, these were four school days, but we saw 16 staff absences. Uh, 12 of those were teachers or certified staff. 42 student absences, so 32 with symptoms, 10 with siblings that would have had to go home. So if you average that out over a five-day week, you're looking at about 52.5 absences per week. Um, not super discrepant from what we would see. One of the other things that we know with the IDPEH guidelines is they have gotten a little less restrictive. <clears throat> so the, the best example I can share is like a headache. Before, if you had a headache, you had to be sent home. Well, if you suffer from migraines and that's a known condition, you don't necessarily have to be sent home anymore if it is a new headache. That's when you get sent home. Same thing with a runny nose. We have many students who are allergy sufferers who would constantly be getting sent home under the old guidelines. Well, now, they may not have to, and, and their siblings could also uh, stay. With what we experienced, though, what we did see was, and we're very um, thankful for our families, 
Most of those absences were reported outside of school. So kids did not come to school with symptoms. Some of them developed symptoms when they were at school. And then all of those symptomatic individuals uh, all were negative or received an alternative diagnosis. Um, and that's what I think most school districts are experiencing as we go through this. We took a look at attendance. Now again, this isn't necessarily an apples to apples comparison. Uh, because you're dealing with two different learning environments. So when we're looking at September of 19, you had students actually physically at school. In September of 20, you have students at home. And what I mean by that is the rules for home, especially during a pandemic, are not as stringent as the rules when, when kids are in person. Uh, so for instance, we are being extremely flexible by design because we know some families, their, their situation may be a little bit different. So if a family can't get on with their kiddo until 11 a.m., we're not necessarily marking that child absent. Now, if we were back in regular school, that child would be absent. So I do want to just take some of these attendance numbers with a grain of salt, but certainly you see less absenteeism with remote learning this fall than you did with actual learning last fall. But if you look at these percentages, they're not, there are none that really drop out as, is really significant here. Although some of this data is very interesting, and I thank uh, Dr. Eichmiller for putting this together, because as we look at, at the average for all students and then some of our at-risk students, you'll see those percentages are higher than the average during remote learning. So certainly something that we want to continue to dive into, and I know members of this board have talked a great deal about that a, a, as we've gone through. So again, just to reiterate the return to learn or school framework, uh, the health department put this together to assist school districts. We were really asking for that. It does provide a lot more clarity, but in my view and our team's view, when we look at this and really talking with the health department, it doesn't allow us to design models right now that would fit with minimal or normal times. Because we're in that moderate level, that's why we're looking at hybrid uh, type of, of models in our recommendation. Actually, before we move on from that, Kevin, can you just maybe, you know, for those folks that are uh, watching online, talk a little bit more by, about why exactly what was proposed over the summer yeah. is unacceptable. I think everyone understands, um, you know, we can't go to pre-COVID, but why, yeah. why exactly isn't what was proposed in the summer acceptable with the new guidance? So, and I appreciate that because when we proposed that over the summer, this return to school framework didn't exist. And also when we proposed that over the summer, conditions were much different here in DuPage County. Um, they were much more favorable for more of a um, minimal transmission than they are right now. And so what we proposed over the summer was basically at the elementary level having all kids report to the school at once. Um, and in that type of a system, you've got a very tight school, right? In, in, in fact, some schools really didn't even have too much extra space. And so one of the challenges now with that is when you have multiple kids with symptoms, you're going to run out of extra rooms to send them to very quickly in terms of uh, the guidance. That proposal that we also had over the summer did require a lot of movement throughout the building. And, and, and again, when we're talking with the health department, they're really asking us to lower the number of individuals in the building at once. And, and so that's where a hybrid model really helps with that because it reduces it uh, to 50%. Now, I think one of the things we hear all the time is, is I will have people call my office or send me an email and say, well, this district's doing it. Why can't you do it? And again, I'm not privy to all of the decision making that takes place in, in different districts. I will tell you many of the examples that people share with me are outside of DuPage County. And so there's part of your answer right there, right? They're getting maybe different advice from, from their health department. So I often hear like LaGrange 102 or Western Springs. One of the other ones that we'll talk about in a little bit is Center Cass, which is right next to us and, and they're doing it, it, it again much different district th than we are. Um, and part of it was they started under the old guidance before the new guidance came in. And so they were up and running a little bit. So it's not as easy as one thinks to just apply that, uh, you know, and ignore that guidance. And so 
because we have a new framework, what we proposed over the summer, in my view, doesn't necessarily fit well with a moderate transmission level. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. So, well, here we are. Uh, <laughs> so we're actively collaborating with many districts for a successful return. Um, I, I don't want anybody to think that we are just in this alone. Um, we're not. Every Friday, every Monday, I get on conference calls with the superintendents across DuPage County. The health department is on each one of those calls. Every Thursday, I'm on a call with all of our DuPage, uh, or excuse me, District 99 feeder districts. So we're looking at all the high schools in the area. We're looking at the elementary. We're looking at the unit districts, all of the feeders. Also, as part of the research for this recommendation, I got in touch with those districts that are in session and have been to talk to them about what have you learned, what's gone well, what hasn't gone well. And it was really eye-opening on many levels what we were able to uncover from talking to districts that are in person. Now, is this list exhaustive of all of the districts? No, it's not. What I tried to do was look at districts that were close to us or districts that were similar in size to us to see kind of how they're operating. Because smaller districts are a little bit more nimble than a bigger district like we are, and it's a little easier to do things in sometimes a smaller district than it is a bigger district. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. So what are we seeing from those other districts? Well, across DuPage, what I am seeing is most school districts are now talking about a return by mid-October. That, that, that's what most of the districts are talking about. I'm not hearing any district right now saying we're going back to what it was you know, pre-COVID. Um, could there be some out there? Sure, but what I'm hearing is most are looking at the guidance and, and, and following a similar path to us. Um, while it's very difficult to plan for anything in our district, elementary and middle, it is very challenging uh, for the high school districts. And the reason it's very challenging for high school districts, when you're trying to run a high school with no movement or little to no movement, uh, that is extremely challenging. And, and so I, I often get questions about why is 99 plan maybe so complex? It's because of what they have to deal with in terms of the guidance. It's very challenging for middle school, but just not on that, that same uh, level. So what are we seeing from our neighbors? Now, I always want to throw a caveat out here because things change. Many of them are having board meetings tonight. And so please know these are just conversations <laughs> we're having. You never know how the end result may be. What we're looking at 99, 99 is considering a hybrid alternating day model that would start about mid-October. District 68, which is Woodridge, is considering an AB alternating day model, again, with a mid-October start. District 66, again, we've talked about them already in this meeting. They're currently attending in person. The students leave before lunch, and depending on the level and how they work their busing, they have their um, middle school students staying a little longer, their intermediate students staying the next, and then their uh, younger students staying uh, just a shorter amount going through. District 61, which is Darien, uh, they're considering a half-day alternating model, and District 60 is also doing the same. That's marker. Now, District 60 is planning on starting a little sooner uh, by October 5th. So, um, again, why did I pick these districts to uh, focus in on? I wanted to look at center cast because of proximity. They're right next to us. They, they border us, and, and, and so it's nice, and I have a great relationship with Andrew, their superintendent. I wanted to look at Yorkville uh, because when you take their high school out, they're a very similar district to us. Um, so they've got 6,000 students. That's what that SS stands for there. Uh, but when you take out their high school, they're, they're very similar. Wheaton is another school district. While they're much larger than us as a school district, um, still a very similar community. And then also North Shore 112. Why did I want to look at North Shore 112? Believe it or not, that's a very similar district to ours, but they're running a model hybrid, half in, uh, the elementary kids go in the morning, half go in the afternoon, which was something that we looked at a great deal. And so I wanted to know how it was going for those uh, particular districts. So here's what we found out. Just like our district, they had very, very small numbers of confirmed positive cases for students and staff. I think North Shore 112 had one student and no staff. Um, some of the other ones were maybe three, four, or five. So you're not looking at a huge number of positive cases. And please know, I'm not dismissing positive cases. Those are all very serious and they can be very, very severe. So I, I think as we discuss numbers, I always wanna just take a step back with our community and, and 
make sure that everyone understands that we're not diminishing a positive case. A positive case is a very serious thing, and it can be life-threatening. Um, what we are seeing from districts, students and staff have been excluded for symptoms or close contacts. Um, very few close contacts at schools, because when you look at the social distancing requirements that schools have to follow, we're not seeing a lot of those close contacts at schools. We're also not seeing a lot of the, the positive cases at school. So for instance, one superintendent I talked to, most of their positive cases were linked to a soccer club. Or most of the positive, uh, or excuse me, close contacts are often the result of maybe a, a sleepover or something that happened outside of school. Um, we are seeing that when people are symptomatic or they're a close contact, most get tested quickly or they get an alternative diagnosis and are back within days. Um, what we're seeing from all of the districts, and please know this is not me uh, asking people to feel bad for administrators, but it's a great deal of administrative work. And that's just not on the administrators. It's the people in the offices. It's, it's Jane's department and personnel. The amount of paperwork and the contact that you have to do, it, it is a lot of work uh, to be back in person. Again, I, I truly believe it's worth it, but it is a great deal of work. And so what happens is a lot of times things have to get put to the side because you're dealing with the emergency right in front of you. Um, and, and I think we saw that at this meeting. You know, normally this time of year, the budget would be the only thing that we're discussing. And that's even taking second place uh, to a lot of these COVID-19 things. Um, and then also guidelines may vary by county. You'll see that, in my view, DuPage is a very, very conservative uh, counting and they're getting even more conservative as of late as our numbers ticked into the IDPH warning level and as we get closer to that substantial transmission so our county is really going to be stringent in terms of making sure that we have six feet of social distancing making sure that we're being very deliberate and following the, uh, the guidelines uh, that's nothing against some of the other counties but I can tell you from speaking with superintendents outside they, they do page has a reputation for being extremely conservative um, what else have we learned? Well, we've learned that every district does things a little bit differently. I don't think that should be a surprise <laughs> to, uh, to anyone up here. Um, but it is very tough to make an apples to apples comparison. Wheaton's a good example. I often get, well, why can't you do everything that Wheaton's doing? Well, in order to make their model work, Wheaton took a lot of staff from the high school and middle school because they were remote and deployed them into the elementary school. That's a great thing, right, where you can be using security guards and, and helping them with um, temperature checks and things like that. We obviously don't have security guards in our uh, school district. Um, very few districts are deploying bus monitors. We talked a great deal about bus monitors and how nice it would be to add that on. Um, that is one of those things as we look a little deeper into our planning that is going to be very very tough to deliver. In fact, you're going to see that coming off of the recommendation. Not that we don't think it's, it, it's important. It's just we can't deploy 40 staff members on buses given everything that we need to do when kids come to school with temperature checks and, and, and screenings and all of that. The other problem if we had bus monitors is if there were a situation the building principal would have to go out to the bus stop. Well, walking around during our transition days you would see just how active our building principals, I know we have our two middle school principals here uh, this evening. I mean, they're running back and forth, door to door, problem solving. The thought of taking them out of that particular situation, um, we, we just can't, we'll, we'll be spread too thin. Temperature checks is an interesting one. And I'm not suggesting we don't do temperature uh, checks as a school district. What the requirement says is that you have to either do a self-certification process daily or wellness screenings and temperature checks. A lot of districts are simply just doing the self-certification and not going that extra step uh, with temperature checks. Uh, we're still very much committed to that. We want to make that work. I think it's another good layer. Uh, there are some concerns from our staff in terms of the thermometers and, and once it starts to get cold out, whether or not those will um, acclimate to the outside temperature. But again, we'll keep working through that with our safety team. Um, any model, remote or in person, and this is across the board, is causing a great deal of stress and is impacting morale on staff and families. Um, when I go around to our buildings, when I talk to our staff, when I hear other superintendents talking about what's taking place in their district, this pandemic has really, really hit educators hard. And it's hit many other sectors hard as well. 
Um, so, so please know we're not the only ones dealing with this, but we do have morale issues, not only in our district, but in, in really every school district that you'll encounter. Um, when, when we're asking people to completely change what they do and their workload and, and all of these things, that is going to have uh, an impact. Um, it's also a huge stressor for families. No matter what model we have, it's a stressor for families to determine whether or not they want, want to send their children to school because of, of, of the risks and, and, and whether or not they feel safe. Um, I can tell you as a parent, many of you, I've got remote learners at home. It's stressful. It's hard. And, and um, the issue is it affects all of us so differently. And so it's very hard to get a united plan together where everybody goes, yep, that's the one, because it, it just impacts us so very differently. Oftentimes I talk to frustrated people and I'll say, okay, what are your suggestions? What would you do? And you get a, a blank look and they go, I don't know, it's just not this, right? And so you see a lot of that, and I, and I get it, I, I, I really do. Um, so again, I, I wanna pause here and thank our families, thank our staff for everything they're doing. Please know um, when people call my office and they, they wanna make sure that I get it, I not only get it as a superintendent, I get it as an educator and I get it as a dad. Um, I, I, I really do, and also um, I have the privilege of being married to a teacher. And so I get that critical lens every night when I go home about any planning process. So trust me, I, I, I really do get it. Um, what are superintendents sharing from these other districts? Here's what they're sharing. It's going well. It's more successful than they had thought, but there are issues. But at the end, they're all saying that it's worth it. I did not talk to one superintendent that's in person that said, don't go this direction. Uh, they're all sharing that it's worth it. I want to pause my part of the presentation and turn it over to Justin Sissel. Justin's going to walk us through the planning process, some different options that we took a look at. James will then come in with a survey, and then I'll come back with our recommendation. So to talk about the planning process, in many ways, the, <laughs> the planning process has been ongoing since around March 9th. But what we're focusing on this evening is really since that mid-August board meeting when we made the shift to fully remote learning, we have also, since that the next morning, been talking about the ways we could begin to think about coming back on site. And as all of the guidance and all of the things that Kevin has referenced have become more clear, we've developed some criteria and considerations as we, as we were presenting a recommendation for this evening. So looking at our lived experiences and what the guidance is telling us, we know that we continue to prioritize in-person instruction. That's been a clear message that we have delivered for quite some time. We also recognize that, as Kevin mentioned, there's a, a real possibility that we could move from different stages of transmission and be required to move from a fully, a, a hybrid model, excuse me, into a fully remote model at some point. And th the look at fluidity is very important at this point because we recognize that there, our current instructional model doesn't translate directly into any kind of a hybrid model. And so what we'd like to do is come up with something that can do exactly that. So that if we do need to make that change at some point in a different direction, it won't cause another massive systemic adjustment. We know that we need to find ways to maintain a robust and rigorous education for our families and students who will choose a fully remote option, which is still part of any plan. We also know that the consistency of scheduling from day to day and week to week is a huge priority for our families. In fact, some of the feedback we've received from early surveys has been, I'm really less concerned with what the plan is with, than I am with the consistency of it and knowing that I can make plans going forward. We know that any of these models will include remote or offsite instruction and so we need to ensure that that remains high quality. We also know that the time for teacher collaboration and professional learning is as important now as it ever has been. I've stood before this board many times and talked about the importance of professional learning for our staff. As we consider asking our teachers to embark upon a third instructional model in really three and a half months of teaching, all told, with you taking out the summer, we need that time to ensure we can do this well. And obviously, safety, health, and well-being is always part of our decision making. As we look to create those, a system that accomplishes those things, we also have to recognize the impact of that upcoming change. The safety and the need to responsibly adhere to the guidance that Kevin's been talking about for a while. And again, what we believe is best instructionally and socially emotionally for the students in District 58. 
Throughout this process, and, and on the screen right now is a quote from the July 30th meeting, we've repeated the concept that for better or for worse, instruction during a pandemic is never going to allow us to do all of the things we can do without those restrictions. And so if we are going to responsibly adhere to and implement all of the guidance that we are being given, there are limitations then that are placed on our instructional capacities. And so our job is to look at all of that and make decisions that reflect our priorities and that we believe are the best that we can do given the very real constraints of the environments. The example of cohorting students, the examples of minimizing movement and mixing, the, you know, the length of time we can spend during a day based on masks and things like that. These all lead to less than ideal situations across the board and yet we work to, as Kevin said, move toward that in-person experience that we do believe will be valuable. When we talk about minimizing the transition, we also need to be clear that yes, we are working to minimize the impact of the transition, but as we've said at previous meetings, there absolutely will be a transition and there will be an impact. There are students in preschool through eighth grade who will see teacher changes as a result of the recommendation that we would make later this evening. And that is not an insignificant impact. We absolutely value all of the relationships that have been built and all of the, the things that have been happening over the first several weeks of instruction. We also know and trust that our teachers can recreate and rebuild classroom communities as they shift. We have examples of classes that have done that in our system every year and found success with building relationships as time goes on. We've worked instructionally to ensure that when that transition happens, students won't be at different places in their learning regardless of where they are in the district. So we know that we can minimize the impact instructionally and academically. We know that for, for students and for staff, quite honestly, we will need to work through the social emotional challenges that come with a, a, a mid-year transition, but I believe that we can do it. It's also one of those points where the fluidity comes back to be important because I think that we need to recognize the size of this change is one that we would hope not to go through again in an, in an academic year. We're a system of 5,000 students and 600 staff. We're not designed to make real quick changes during a school year, but we can get through it with thoughtful planning and purposeful collaboration. As we looked at the models to consider at this time, we did some early narrowing based upon the guidance, based upon our experiences, based upon all of the things that we've learned. And so as, as Member Olchek inquired, that modified on-site plan from August, we did consider it, but based upon those experiences, the ways we'll need to use space differently just in, in, in reflecting on the way our transition days occurred and what's happening with our own, with on-site instruction now, we, we pretty quickly realized this model wasn't going to be viable. And so at the elementary level, we looked at two specific models. One idea or one concept is that around half of the students, a smaller number than previously determined, would attend on site every other day for a certain period of time. The second model we looked at was that half of the students would attend on site in the morning and half of the students would on, attend on site in the afternoon each day. So there would be a slightly smaller window of on site instruction, but it would allow for daily on site instruction for K through six. At the middle school level, we have previously established that we, our space constraints really don't allow us um, to adhere to the guidance and bring all students on at once. So we looked at two different hybrid models. One would be half of the students attending every other day at the same period of time. And the other would be half of the students attending every other day, again, in sort of an AM, PM model. Again, that model in this case would, for the, for the middle school, would make a smaller total amount of time that students would have been on site over the course of a week. Um, I'll talk about how we get, get, gain some feedback on these models in the next slides. I'm not going to walk through every pro and con at this moment in the interest of moving forward with the recommendation. But as we move to the next slide, um, we've had several formal meetings and informal conversations. The list of meetings there was published at the last board meeting in, on, uh, on September 14th. We've also had a faculty meeting at each building where all staff were able to view each of those models that I discussed on the previous slide, albeit briefly, and, and, just, and provide some initial feedback and actually more often a number of initial questions around each model. And that is really the beginning of feedback and dialogue around the models that we will ultimately recommend as we move forward. We know that this is only the first step in gathering feedback from, from our staff and from our teachers to make sure that the details make sense for everyone. There will be meetings that will occur um, as soon as a plan might be approved, we will start to put together opportunities for dialogue around all of the details where we can provide administrative thoughts and recommendations to additional staff, 
um, administrators and teachers to gain feedback as we go through. So again, the first set of meetings was the beginning, and that will go on. However, we did receive quite a bit of feedback through those first meetings. And acknowledging, just as with anything, there certainly is feedback on all sides of each issue. There are some points that came up loud and clear through that initial set of feedback. One is that a benefit of any plan is the amount of in-person instruction. There, there's, there's no disagreement that in-person instruction is ultimately superior to remote instruction. There's also significant acknowledgement that increased time is needed as we think about planning for remote and off-site, especially alongside some on-site model. We've received tremendous feedback from our community that remote learning is significantly improved since last spring and that is attributed most directly to the tremendously long hours our teachers are working right now to make that the experience. Kevin mentioned this earlier, but we also want to acknowledge that the idea of simply having 10 students zoom into a classroom while 10 students are physically present in a classroom is not necessarily the instructional model we want to pursue. Um, you can teach really well remotely and you can teach really well on site and it's really very challenging to do both in the very same moment. It's not to say that in a very small group of students there couldn't be opportunities where that exact model, one or two in a small group and a third on a, on a device, might be a little bit more workable because of the level of what we're talking about. When we talk about full classroom settings, the idea of doing those two things at once, is we, we, just, we believe we can do better as a district. As we heard from staff, certainly there were thoughts on all of the models, but we did see some, some momentum as staff feedback began to coalesce beyond, behind that morning-afternoon split model for elementary and the alternating day with students on site for a, a larger portion of the day at the middle school. So again, while I'm not going to say it was unanimous, there certainly was a lot of momentum in those directions. Cleaning time is always a consideration and something we need to make sure that we are cognizant of in every model and that came through from staff as well as all of the health and safety components that we need to make sure are in place just as we've talked about responsibly following the guidance. We've heard about parent-teacher conferences falling right at the potential time of a transition and how those conversations might not be as valuable in that moment as they might be in a subsequent moment when we've come through that transition a little bit. The other reality is that, would, that, that creates for a very intense week for families and for staff as we're trying to navigate a pretty significant transition. There were staff groups that certainly suggested the idea of a fully remote day as part of a plan for a variety of reasons, including just a, a difference of schedule and then keeping the, that, that remote practice in place. And the last two bullet points, I think, and again, when we're saying staff, we're talking administratively, teachers, some of our instructional assistants were part of this. While there may be perceptions in some parts of, of the community that this, is, that this should have already been done from a teaching and learning and planning and collaborating and responding to feedback and answering questions and developing robust lessons perspective, we, this is moving quickly. And the reality is that many of our teachers are feeling right about now that they're getting into a groove with remote learning and with their classes. And we are asking them to make another change. And I, and I believe that that change is well-intentioned and, and I think that it is best for our students and I think we can, as I said earlier, as a system, we can move through it. But we also have to recognize what we're asking of administrators, what we're asking of staff in the time frame that we're doing it. Our administrators know the responsiveness that our community expects our teachers know the level of instruction that our community expects and they all hold themselves to those same high standards. And so in order for them to feel that they are doing this job to the best of their ability, there's a lot of planning and a lot of processing and a lot of things that do need to take place as we move into this very significant transition. And so as we recognize all of those things, it is important for us to acknowledge the, the impact of this change on staff as well as on students and families and just ensure that we are providing the time and the space for those supportive structures to be there as we move into the transition. James is going to come up now and share some data. All right, so I will briefly go through some of the, the survey responses. And this was, uh, I know we've been getting a lot of input from parents lately and, that, and that'll continue because I think it's important to get that feedback. Um, this is a survey that went out uh, a week ago from the previous Friday regarding uh, parents' preferences or what they were considering for uh, as we pursue an on-site learning plan. And to, to kind of understand the need for this survey, because I, I, I think we're hearing from parents that it is a lot to keep up with this. Uh, and we got a really impressive response here with 3,600 parents responding in, in a matter of four or five days. So I, re I really do appreciate 
the feedback that our families have been giving us. But if you think about the planning process that Justin and Kevin laid out, uh, we hit a point where we're getting close to figuring out what is feasible in each model. We have to support remote learners, we have to support on-site learners. You really start to have to have a sense of how many students are going to be in each model to, to understand what's feasible and what's possible and what some of the initial staffing, staffing considerations would be. Um, and the most recent data we had for parent preferences on this was from August, and which, which usually wouldn't be that long ago, but in our current state, it really is a long time ago, and the data was, wasn't necessarily something that we could be confident would be accurate of where our parents stood um, considering the current situation. So at the same time, you know, we recognize that parents can't tell us which option they want if they don't know all of the details. So it's kind of that chicken or the egg moment. So we landed on this survey to help guide our final our final week of developing this proposal that you're seeing tonight, and, and again, that feasibility, we decided to ask the question in a way that um, gave three options. The first option being, uh, regardless of the final details of the plan, we do intend to send our child to school or our children to school uh, for a hybrid learning model to participate in that on-site portion of the day. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, there, there, there is the option for parent select. Uh, regardless of what the plan is, I do not intend to send my child uh, and I choose, uh, I'll, I'll elect the fully remote option for my child. Then obviously there's that other chunk kind of that falls in the middle, which, well, I can't really tell you uh, unless I understand the final details of the plan. So wh while at 26.6%, you can see that was the, 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 the chosen middle option that needed additional details, that is a pretty big number. If you, if you think about our planning process, this gave us some kind of guidelines for kind of some boundaries for where we knew it would fall. Um, you know, we can assume that our on-site you know, number of quantity of students was going to be at least 66% and that our remote was going to be at least 7%. You could kind of take portions of that 26.6 and put them in either group and allow us to say, well, we should be able to operate within those boundaries and we should be able to have a plan that should be, uh, be able to be successful and adjust our staffing in a way that can make it work. So it really was helpful in, in letting us determine the feasibility of our plans. Um, you know, a question you might ask is, well, what do we know about the 26.6%? Um, so we did have an open response question that helped, uh, helped us understand what some of those people, uh, which way they were leaning, you might say. And so we, of the 900 or so people that selected that option, around 320 left an open response. And so kind of casually going through that, I, I think you got a sense that people were rather concerned with the safety protocols that would be established, or they were concerned with really the logistical details and transportation, the time of day, uh, and, and that sort of thing. I would say... Uh, that more of that group w was more concerned with, under not more concerned, their decision hinged more on understanding the final details of the plan and, and they seemed to lean um, and they would like to pursue the on-site option if it worked out logistically for their family. Uh, so anyways, that, that this was really helpful for us to plan. If you want a point of comparison, uh, the, the number for on-site, if you recall, was, a, a, was about 75% in August with around, uh, I think, 23% electing for the remote, uh, or the remote, or the online academy as we had described it back in August. Now quickly running through some of these numbers, uh, again our school percentages were pretty similar. There were a couple schools that looked different than they did in August. Again, that was because th those schools that did look different, uh, I'd say had a, were the ones that had a higher percentage of parents that were uh, waiting to hear those additional details. The grade level chart, uh, I, I think it was pretty remarkable how consistent this was across grade levels. You don't really see any significant differences based on, on grade levels. Uh, again, I, I think a pretty common theme that uh, things are pretty uniform in that regard. <clears throat> the bus question uh, we asked again, 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 this is a really important part of our planning, is understanding uh, the logistics, the time of day, and understanding, roughly speaking, how many students are going to utilize uh, the bus was, a, again, a really important part of our planning process, and you'll hear more about that this evening. Again, for the point of comparison, uh, this number was, I, I believe, around 68% when we asked in August. And then to kind of to port that onto a, another number, I, I, in speaking with uh, Katie Hannigan a little bit and, and Todd about the bus numbers, that, that equated approximately to about 60% of the routes that we had had uh, in previous years. So in other words, when they took that 68% number and started mapping out routes, um, it was about 60% of our ridership under normal circumstances. So we can presume, again, you know, getting a, getting a little ahead of ourselves until we get final commitment numbers, but uh, th that number should be fairly similar um, should the 63% number uh, hold to be true when we do get final commitments. So, and that's just a quick summary of the survey data.
Okay, so now we're at the point of the presentation where we want to talk about administrative uh, recommendations and certainly open it up to the board for any questions after uh, we get there. We're going to start off by talking about preschool, then we'll do elementary, and then we'll finish up with middle school. So in terms of preschool, uh, the preschool program is, is divided into different models. Um, one of the things I think we all agree on is the kiddos who need to be in school the most sometimes have the hardest time with a lot of the requirements that we have, whether that's mask wearing or social distancing. Um, also, when you're looking at a preschool program, the most effective preschool programs and kindergarten programs are all based on play. And it makes it extremely challenging to do in-person instruction for, for some of our preschool groups because things like the sandbox and, and other things just aren't available like they once were. But as we're looking at the blended model, and that would be a mix of uh, general education students and students with special needs, we're looking at um, offering a consistent five day a week experience for all of our kids, so kids come every day. Um, the synchronous time would be about an hour and a half. There would be asynchronous activities available as well for those families who chose so. And we'd be looking at three sessions. Again, each about an hour and a half with an hour in between uh, to clean those uh, preschool rooms. When we look at our special programs for pre-K, that's our developmental learning program and RISE, those are our students who are on the autism spectrum. Um, again, we're looking at that consistent five day a week uh, per model, uh, two hours and 15 minutes, and then again with that break in between. So that's more of an AM and a PM type of a, a model that we're looking at for that portion of our preschool. <coughs> Again, you can kind of get a sense of, of what that would look like through a schedule that uh, Jessica Stewart and Jacqueline Goddard uh, and their team ha had created here. So this is for your reference. As we look at the elementary, the elementary we're going to divide up into kindergarten and grades one through six. And, and I should have said this before we, we started with the preschool, but again, what are we prioritizing? How are we making these recommendations? Health and safety, number one trying to maximize in-person instruction and trying to minimize those disruptions to the greatest extent possible. So that's kind of the order as we go through this. When we looked at the elementary model, one of the things that kept bubbling up over and over again was the importance of having students on site every day. So how can we do this in a safe way but get kids there every single day? And so what we're looking at at the elementary model is where group A would attend for two and a half hours and then you would have that break in between and then group B would come after that and that would be the PM model. Um, groups would be assigned on a number of factors. It wouldn't be just an alphabetical split. It can't be and here's why. Um, siblings. We don't want to split up families at the elementary level. Transportation needs. I'm going to speak to that at greater length in a little bit but the way we have to do our busings is going to you know predominantly fall in the afternoon academic needs. There may be certain courses or, or, or certain content areas or, or certain special areas that we can only offer at certain times in the day that a student may need. And so that might be uh, one of the reasons why we place a student in the AM or the PM. So for grades one through six, there will be a combination of synchronous and asynchronous instruction uh, that will occur during the off-site portion. So again, right now, all of our specials are synchronous, or excuse me, asynchronous. We have the opportunity to on the offsite um, to really add to that and, and continue with that planning. One of the things I want to point out, though, is right now that asynchronous, you've got teachers who are pretty much available all day, right? They, they can be responsive. Um, and a lot of that is due to we're teaching math remotely, we're teaching um, ELA remotely. And so there's a lot of questions and teachers are doing a great job being responsive, but it takes such a long time when you're in that kind of a model. So here in this model, the asynchronous will look different. Why does it look different? If you've got a classroom teacher who's teaching to one set of students in the morning, those students go home and do their um, asynchronous activities, that teacher can't be responsive to them like they have been because now they're teaching a different set of students. And, and, and so, um, as we look at this, I want to be very clear, when, you, when you're going to on-site, you're, you're making some trade-offs. But how can we add on to the other half of the day? Again, specials are a great opportunity to add some of that synchronous time in. Uh, but one of the biggest concerns I've heard from our staff is, yes, in-person 
However, what is this other time going to look like if I have kids in, in, in both models? And so we have to be very conscious of that. And over the next several weeks, as we fine tune everything and, and finalize it, uh, assuming the board approves uh, our recommendation, this is something we really are gonna be clear with our families about, about what it looks like when they're on site and what it looks like when they're off site. And I think what you can envision when they're on site is really those, those core content areas of math, ELA, social emotional learning, making sure that we hit those extremely hard and then developing asynchronous activities. For kindergarten, we are a half day program this year. One of the nice things about this model, at least in my view, is that you can accomplish the entire kindergarten program while kids are on site if they choose the on site option, which means kindergartners don't have to go home and then log on to Zoom and things like that. I think most of our families would welcome that because five-year-olds on Zoom is a very, very challenging experience to say the least. With every plan, we have to offer a full remote option. And I think this is very important. Remember, you don't just have individuals out there who, who just say, well, I'm not sending my kiddo to school. Um, you also have individuals who have family members with underlying conditions at their homes. You have students with underlying conditions at their home. So we want to make very sure that our remote options are not just a camera in the back of the classroom or, or, or something to just check off a box. There are people out there who need a remote option for very, very good reasons. And so our instructional time for that would be consistent with ISBE's recommendation. It would be provided by District 58 certified staff members. Um, content would be consistent across the grade levels. Classroom communities will continue to be created with students grouped by the home school to the greatest extent possible. And in very specialized situations, you may have to make some exceptions because the numbers might not quite be there. But one of the things that we heard throughout the summer was really good feedback about an online academy Parents had a real desire to be connected to their home school. And so what you see with this proposal is that it's District 58 teachers. It's not a third party software. And also trying to keep kids connected to their home school. Again, though, this is really where we need to see where the numbers are going to pan out. I can't sit here tonight and tell you that every kid's always gonna have their same teacher or, or, or all of that because you could have a situation where let's say you have 60 kids in a grade level and 55 or 58 take the in-person and two take the remote. Well, we can't run a section for two kids, so we may have to combine them with a partner school or something like that in order to be the most effective. Again, though, I think you see our priorities and what we'll try and do through the planning process. The other thing I, I, I know as an elementary parent, the thought of kids maybe switching teachers is very, very concerning in any model. I want to assure you and, and say the exact same things Justin did or reiterate those, but also know that as we're looking at grade level approaches, there are still gonna be in contact with any teacher they may have had. And so it's not like they're never going to see people again. Again, we hope to really minimize this, but depending on how these numbers shake out, that is the downside to having two different options because the numbers aren't always gonna come out uniform. So the middle school recommendation. Middle schools, um, in Matt and Amy are here, two middle school principals. Um, the assistant principals, they spent a great deal of time, like the elementary principals, really looking at this. And it is a, uh, please know I'm not dismissing the, the work that we did at the elementary level, but middle school is harder. It, it really is because you're looking at all these moving pieces and singleton classes and it, it, it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, we settled on the alternating day model uh, because as you look at the guidance, it really talks about prioritizing in-person instruction for students under 13. It doesn't mean that we don't want to prioritize that for our middle school kids, but they can handle a lot more of the remote than, let's say, a first grader or a second grader. But they still need those in-person connections. I can say that as a middle school parent as well. Um, what we like about this model is it's an eight period day. So students are going to every one of their classes every single day. Um, the same schedule is run on site and off site. Okay, so you're on site Monday for your eight period day, but Tuesday you're doing the same thing, but now it's remote. So it allows for a lot of, uh, or I shouldn't say a lot, let's hope it's never a lot, but it does allow for an easy transition from one uh, to the other. So you can shift to full remote. 
The asynchronous instruction occurs for the remainder of the day after the lunch break. So when kids go home, that's when they can work on their assignments, that's when they can work on the activities that their uh, teachers gave them, or when they're done online for that particular day. So here's what it looks like. We decided not to go with an alphabetical model, and that was done very deliberately. We're having seventh grade attend on-site Monday and Wednesday and every other Friday. They would be off-site Tuesday, Thursday, and every other Friday. Eighth grade would be the opposite of that, but in the same spirit. Why is that helpful? Um, it's helpful because if we went to an alphabetical model, A through L and M through Z, what you would see there is that seventh grade teacher that had A through L on one day would then have M through Z on the next. And so the A through L kids on their off day wouldn't be able to get that same teacher. By having seventh grade there all together, they then can repeat the same thing off-site and eighth grade can do the same thing. So it does allow for a lot of continuity. Um, transportation will be available and band, choir, and orchestra will be offered. Now before we get to the, um, oh we can keep going through this because uh, actually that's my next point. Sorry James. Oh boy. <laughs> there, there we go. Um, students are placed into cohorts teachers would have to rotate through the classrooms for on-site instruction. Why? Because of that moderate transmission level. But grade level instruction remains consistent. An option for students to attend off-site each day will also be offered. You have to have a remote option in here. Cohorts of remote students will be developed to follow the same eight period day. Students will remain grouped by homeschool to the greatest extent possible, so between Herrick and O'Neill. So picture this, you know, once we get the numbers, then we look at how many kids are going to be on site, how many kids are going to be off site. So, as a former middle school teacher, I could have, I always taught six sections. In this model, four of my sections could be in person, and two of them could be remote. So, maybe my final two rotations, I'm now zooming in with my off site cohort. So, we have to cohort our students again because of the guidance. Now, when you create those cohorts, you do have to do schedule changes. And, and I know that is something, my email has been flooded over the weekend with, with, with questions and calls about why you know, we're building these relationships. And again, there is no perfect solution as we go through these. What we're trying to build now is a model that can be fluid should we ever have to switch with minimal disruptions. But we do recognize that this is something. Now, I will also tell you we've been very up front, I, I do know I've gotten some staff feedback saying, do parents really know this? And my answer to that is absolutely. We talked about this at great length several times in the summer. We also, when we did transition days at the middle school, we intentionally grouped them as grade levels so they can meet all of the teachers in the event we had to shift to this kind of a model. And so, yes, I recognize that everything we say doesn't always sink in, but, but this is one of those situations where this will have to happen now when you look at some of our sections, it doesn't mean that kids are going to get all new teachers. There may only be social, two social studies teachers in a grade level, so you still have a very good chance of, of remaining consistent with your teacher. But again, in order to accomplish on-site instruction, this is one of those trade-offs. So again, in all cases, those students with highly specified specialized class schedules may require even additional consideration. And this is where you may have a student who's in math two with French and gifted ELA, like you, you, you may have to do some things and that's where our middle school principals will really work with families to have those. Okay, so our communication timeline. If the board were to approve our recommendation, tomorrow I would send an email out to families which would include the following. We provide detail of what these hybrid models are going to look like. We will put a request to fill out a commitment form in PowerSchool regarding whether or not you're going to send your child on site and whether or not you're going to select the transportation. The default, if people do not fill this out, would be that you're not picking the transportation, but you are selecting in person. We will start Friday at the building levels calling families that have not filled this out because we want to make sure that those all get done. October 2nd, an additional FAQ document will be shared based on the questions that have been submitted. So also in my letter, we are going to have that form to submit questions. Um, I would ask the community 
to submit your questions on that form, I won't be able to respond to all of the individual questions, put it in that form, and then that's how we'll be able to respond to those. Our team will, will make sure that we uh, parse all of those out. October 5th, commitment forms would be due from families at 9 a.m. And then by October 9th, we would be notifying families if their child at the elementary would be in the a.m. or the p.m. section. Um, individual families with questions on that would have to contact the building, not the district, as those would be assigned at the building level. October 16th, we'd be sending out a communication to all families regarding final teacher assignments, middle school schedules, The transition week would look like this in our recommendation. We'd be taking, um, the state gave us five planning days to utilize. We've used three of them. We talked about saving them for the next tra uh, transition. So what we're recommending, and I think you've heard this from our staff as well, is that the 16th and 19th, that Friday and Monday, would be planning days for staff. Um, they'd be planning for the change in instructional model, communicating with families to support the shift, articulation between those staff members as class configurations may change, and then again, reviewing all those safety procedures and protocols. So then we'd have three days of on-site instruction. That Friday was a scheduled school improvement day and a day off already. That would be a fabulous opportunity for us to come back and sit with our staffs and say, what went well? What do we need to improve on? What questions do you have? And, and to really do a, a nice review along with the professional development. And then we could start full blown the following week. Uh, parent-teacher conferences, we would be recommending that we push those back to the end of November or early December, which is not that uncommon to have parent-teacher conferences in November. Right now, the thought of putting those in addition to the transition week, I think is giving everybody a uh, great pause. So here's what the middle school rotation could look like. Again, pay particular close attention to those Fridays. So you would see, for consistency purposes, what we didn't want to do was have 7th grade, 8th grade, 7th grade, 8th grade, 7th grade, 8th grade, and then it's a different day of the week as you start to go through. We wanted that consistency for families. So that Friday, though, we would let parents know when do you have the 7th graders in, when do you have the 8th graders in. Transportation. We do have to provide transportation. Um, we're, we're bound to it. Um, now, transportation is going to look a little bit different during COVID-19. 50 is the max on a bus that we can provide. What we can never guarantee during COVID, although we'll do our best to, to make sure that kiddos are separated, what we can't do though is we can't guarantee six feet of social distancing on a bus. It's just you, you don't have enough seats on a bus to accomplish that. Uh, but every child has to wear a mask and every family has to um, complete the self-certification prior to getting on a bus. Uh, logistics will continue to be addressed with our partner districts, 99, 68. A lot of people don't know, but we also provide busing for our two parochial schools, St. Mary of Gaston and St. Joseph. I will tell you that we heard the board loud and clear over some of the times that um, we proposed with the initial plan. I will tell you that our times are more in line with what we're traditionally used to. Here in District uh, 58, we, we really did go to bat and make sure that uh, we had an equal voice at the table uh, to make sure that we got the times that we needed uh, to make this all work, which is no small feat. So I want to compliment Katie and Todd for all of their hard work with the bus company in the various districts. Elementary routes, though, would only be offered for the PM session. Why? We can't double our transportation budget. I would love to be able to run an AM route and a PM route. When you look at those numbers that we were just dealing with, we cannot afford to uh, double our transportation. Uh, kindergarten students, though, would continue to receive busing based on their previous assignment. And um, so families would then have to commit to busing by October 5th under this plan. So if you needed busing, you would be in the PM uh, versus the AM. And I know that isn't always everybody's favorite, including my own, but that is the only way that we could make this work and get students to attend daily at the elementary school. So protocols. All of our health and safety protocols are based on ISB, IDPH, and the DuPage County Health Department guidelines. They're already established in the district. Uh, we implemented them effectively during the transition days. They're currently being implemented for our special needs students. However, that doesn't mean that we don't have to add to it or we don't have to tweak things as we're talking about bringing in more students. So we've already been meeting with all of our associations. We've got meetings on the calendar for next week. We'll add more if we need to 
to make sure that we're all comfortable with our safety protocols and procedures. Um, again, things may need to be added to accommodate all of our students. We're committed to working with all of our stakeholders to make sure that we get the health and safety protocols down so everybody feels comfortable. I want to spend a few moments talking about risk. I've said this numerous times throughout the summer. There is no risk-free environment. I cannot sit here as the superintendent of schools and tell you that if we bring back students, you will never have COVID-19 in District 58. Um, we have COVID-19 everywhere in our society. Schools are not immune to it. Um, it can be transmitted anywhere. I will say this, this is my opinion. I think schools are much safer than most environments. The requirements that we have are hospital-like, much safer in my opinion than a restaurant, a golf course, a grocery store, walking around downtown. Uh, the requirements that we have are intended to keep people safe and we, uh, with our cleaning protocols and all of that, I do think schools are much safer than most environments. But again, it is not a risk-free environment. The other point I want to make is schools can only do so much. We need everyone to act responsibly in and out of schools. I cannot tell you how many times this summer or in the fall I've received comments from staff members or comments from community members demanding that schools are held to a high standard, and I think that's really good. But I've also seen some of those same individuals not follow the things that were being demanded of us. And so what I'm trying to say here is that if we want schools to open, we all have to act responsibly in and out of schools because some of the things that take place outside of schools can have a major impact on what we're able to do inside of schools. So again, it's going to take a commitment, getting things like flu shots, uh, sanitizing hands, all of those things. We've got to have a good community effort if we want to do this. So a look ahead. If approved, uh, these models would be implemented starting the week of 1019, and we'd be looking to do this through winter break. I think one of the things you'll hear from staff is that we need that continuity, and you'll hear that from families. Uh, of course, throughout this process, you'd have ongoing review, support, collaboration. Regular updates would continue to be provided to the board and the community. Uh, we're finalizing <coughs> right now champions and Downers Grove Park District partnerships. We do believe we're going to be able to offer um, champions at bookends of the day. So if you're taking that morning option, we may be able to set something up where you could drop your kids off. They'd still have to leave midday, but you could at least have that before school care. And then after school as well, if your child was in the PM, you could then have that after school care. So we do believe that that is going to be available. Our park district has been phenomenal. Um, we're going to ask them once again to see what they can help us out with in terms of that elementary schedule to see if they could offer some things for families who needed that. Um, again, we come back in January if this is approved and thoroughly review that. Uh, consideration uh, needs to continue to take place for more of these specialized planning uh, situations that we talked about. And again, we've got a lot of work to do in the next couple of weeks to make sure that everything gets finalized should the board approve this. So at that point, I'm sure we're going to have several questions. Um, so. <laughs> I'm going to give Justin this area. I'll go back to my uh, chair over there and we'll do the best that we can. Uh, but we also have our other assistant superintendents who are here to help answer questions uh, that may be uh, to their area. For instance, Jane with personnel, James with technology, Todd with busing, and so on and so forth. Well, thank you very much. And, and, and thank you, Dr. Russell, Dr. Eichmiller, and Mr. Sissel for the very thorough presentation and for, for everybody else for, for, for putting that together. Um, real quick, I just kind of want to kick off with, with saying uh, a couple things, and, and one of them is um, I've been reached out to by my more teachers over the last uh, week or so than I have my entire time on the board, and it's been really nice uh, to hear from them and sort of get sort of a, 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 direct, a, a direct feed, and so I, some of them thoroughly were just apologizing to me over and over again for, for reaching out to me about it, but I, I just want to say how much it was appreciated and, and how much I enjoyed speaking with all of them, because I think a good half of them I didn't, I didn't know at all. Uh, I, and I did want to take a minute and say, uh, I, I know one of the questions I got back in, in July and in August was um, why I was so adamant for, for some of the plans that we were going through, and, and part of that is uh, I was very concerned about the systemic shift that we're, we're now talking about now and having to make, make a change. 
And so I think the question that I have is, and I know that we're, we're, we're trying to get ourselves locked in here, at, you know, at least through winter break, but should there need to be a change to, to move in either direction, a positive direction where we could get more hours of time or we have to go back into remote, do we feel like the, the proposal here today that, that we're looking at gives us that flexibility to at least take, obviously, lesson models and stuff will have to change because the day layout is going to look different, but do we feel that, that we would be able to avoid as large of a systemic shift locking in once we go through this, this, this process here today? Go ahead, Justin. Sure. Uh, from a middle school perspective, I think that there is certainly room to build. Um, if you know, Again, we're looking at the number of hours on site right now, not including lunch. So I think we've talked in the past about any additional hours on site would require building in a lunch structure. But in terms of keeping, you know, and again, it will depend on, on what the guidance ultimately says at that point in time, but we could certainly expand the, the length of class periods, make one, you know, put a lunch within there and, and, and keep the, that cohort structure together without changing teachers. Again, that's not a, it's not an overnight switch, but in terms of that structure, it certainly could be maintained. At the elementary level, with that AMPM model, it does not lend itself as easily to increasing time on site because, you know, unless we were in a situation where cleaning between things was no longer necessary and we could shorten that window in between or, or, or things of that nature, it, it isn't necessarily as easy to lengthen the on site time in that current model. So, so truthfully, the, the, ele the, the elementary model would present a bit of a challenge if we were to look to increase some of those things. But again, when we would do that increase, it would, it would be dependent on guidance that allowed us to move toward even further um, time on site. The other uh, benefit of, of, of these programs is in the event we had to switch to remote and, and, and we can get into, you know, about what that would look like, they both lend themselves extremely well to shifting into remote setting relatively easily and then shifting back to an in-person setting. Now, please know I'm not advocating for doing that frequently. Uh, if we were to do something like that, it would have to be very thoughtful, very deliberate, and you'd be talking about weeks at a time uh, should that happen. Uh, but both of these models do allow you to switch to that uh, very easily. In terms of the elementary model, you know, that was one of the big discussions that we had does this, do we have the ability to add on to this model? And, and you know, one of the trade-offs is if you go the alternating day route, you can always add to it. The, the, the problem with that one at the elementary level in particular is it doesn't have the students there every single day. And, and so that is something uh, that we'd have to take a look at. Now, in terms of cleaning efficiency and those things, we could get better at those things. And, and, and you know, we can continue to revisit that to see if there's any way to stretch uh, more time. I, I don't think we're in that position right now, especially with the amount of plan time that our teachers need, but we've also developed models for, you know, what we recommended over the summer that we could take a look at. Should we want to pivot to more? And those models are still available to us in that modified on-site plan. So there are things that are built that could be, you know, redeployed uh, should we want to go in that direction. So I do agree with Justin, the elementary is much more challenging. Uh, nothing's impossible, though, depending on where we're at. I just think before we made any big changes like that, uh, we'd have to be very, very deliberate and really plan that out. So uh, the, the conversations I w was having with staff um, was 100% in, in support of a, an AB, AM, PM split. And uh, the other piece was, um, but the other, the other part I was hearing was from a lot of them was in advocating for actually more time on, on site and the idea of, hey, why can't we do that, that four hour, one hour split that we had uh, talked about before. Um, and, and I know people are pointing to Senator Cat, and I wish we could be in that, in that same situation as well. I, I guess the question I have is, would this allow for that? Say we, we, we go up a tier in the, um, in the, in the DuPage County Health Department stats, would we, allow, would we be able to combine those afternoon and morning kids then once we get to that level in, into one group that would allow us to expand that? Or is that group size still gonna be too large for us to, to put into a classroom together? Uh, it really is site dependent in, in how many kids you are gonna get in that remote model. Uh, so one of the things that we'd be able to better assess that particular question is once we determine how many kids will be on site versus how many kids would be 
off-site uh, because that's going to determine how big your classes are and then how much space you have to really um, achieve that social distancing that that's a challenge that we'd have to take a look at once we get those numbers but we'll have better sense of, of where everybody's at once we do get those numbers Justin I don't know if you wanted to add I was going to say about exactly what you just said yeah any of these models can be built upon um, you know uh, the middle school one because you're doing alternating day you can add another hour you can add lunch you know and again I'm not suggesting we do that right now but sure. but you could I think you've got several options at the elementary school should we get to that position though I, I, I again I, I think it's much easier to talk about that once we know what our final numbers are and we can we can build that um, but that would you know require a, a change in how we're allocating staff and in those types of things which again is not impossible we, we've done that this summer so again I think what we need to do is let, let's see where those numbers fall out but certainly I think anything can be built upon yeah I, I think a message that I heard loud and clear was that um, everybody is prepared to work harder this year <laughs> I mean I think everybody sitting in this room here today is I am at my day job I am in my role on, on the board uh, I, it is clear to me in the level of work that's happening in the remote learning classrooms that a tremendous amount of work is going into this. And I think that what I want to make sure is that we're, that we're reassuring when, when we split at the, the grade school level, because uh, that model is a little bit, uh, because of that model, that, uh, that we have a good solid plan for how we run that off-site process because the, the asynchronous content has been pretty strong. And then the other aspect of it has been the, the flow that we have through the day where, where we're on for half an hour, then off for 20, then back for 25, then off for 40. That whole thing has allowed people an opportunity to kind of um, share, uh, kind of guide the students along in that process. And I just want to, you know, I just want to make sure that the burden on, on families on asynchronous time and the burden on staff creating that content, that we find a good way to, to share that burden uh, when creating content and, um, and also putting a clear and concise process together for the kids that have gotten into a nice rhythm of, of the back and forth and, and the idea of, of two and a half hours on and then two and a half hours completely disconnected. Now, I, I saw on the slide that, that, that there, there was going to be some synchronous going on in the afternoon, and my guess is that some of that stuff is still getting ironed out and it looked like it was going to be associated with specials and stuff like that but I think that that's going to be incredibly important to the success of what a what a, um, a hybrid model is going to, going to look like so um, I have other things but I, I want to open it up to, to everybody else and then um, fill in this thing. I, I want to um, that was the number one thing on my list actually what you brought up was uh, how to share the burden or because the teachers um, through no no, no small uh, feat of their of their work they have knocked it out of the park because of all the people I've talked to either every parent had a very low expectation of what this was gonna look like but everyone is overwhelmingly like surprised and ecstatic about how the day is going for their kids now nobody you know there a lot of parents didn't want to be in remote um, but they were pleased with the flow of how it's going and so the concern that I've heard from parents and teachers is that piece that Darren was just talking about because I know that um, in some schools the teachers have their zoom on like they the kids might be doing their asynchronous work but they can touch base that would no longer be available to the kiddos or to the parents to touch base so if we could tap the teachers for how they think would be the best way to handle that for the afternoons or the mornings when the kids are at home uh, to make it so that it's not a burden for the parent or for the teachers and for the parents but mostly for the teachers um, who need to take care of the kiddos right in front of them at the time yeah it, that so that really is precisely one of the conversations that will happen in the coming days just as the just as we did with synchronous and asynchronous minutes we will set out a district plan and, and get teacher feedback on it in terms of how we will prioritize on-site minutes what we'll, what we'll spend there and then how, we'll, how we will focus those off-site minutes. I think I appreciate the point being raised that teachers won't be available in the same way during the instructional day like they have been during remote learning. They'll be available the way they were 
back when we were all on site, which is out, outside of the times that students are in front of them. Because when students are in front of a teacher, we would expect them to be focusing on those students that are in front of them. And so that's exactly right. We will need to think of ways to reconceptualize the asynchronous time. Obviously, yes, there's an opportunity for potentially some synchronous remote specials and some, some other things like that. But there will be a piece of it that, that will be, as Kevin mentioned earlier, a little more on the, on the independent or on the extension activities. And I think, Darren, to your point of that back and forth, the, the I see you in the morning today, you go home and you know exactly what you're working on because I've been able to preview some of that for you, or I see you in the afternoon and I preview tomorrow morning's work for you until I see you again. Some of that asynchronous work may look a lot more like what asynchronous work looked like pre-COVID, where the feedback, rather than coming through a seesaw assignment, is coming in tomorrow morning when we talk about it together when we're back together in person. And so I think those are the ways we'll look at it. Obviously, we don't get to five hours just with what I've said, so we will have to look at how we can structure content delivery and how we can provide support structures and maybe centralize the development of some of those pieces so that the content continues to be of, of the, the quality and the experience that we're looking for and we have seen, but as you said, the, the burden of creating all of that and being responsible for the delivery of all of that simultaneously is, is manageable for all of our staff. Okay. Yeah, and I think to piggyback off of that, when, you, when you're talking about focusing on those major content areas when the kids are in, that will help with a number of those questions, right? Because so many of those questions are centered around math or, or ELA. And so being able to have that daily contact with your teacher, I think it, it's, it's twofold. It, it's going to reduce those online questions because kids are actually there with their teachers. I also think, and, and this is what I wish more people, they could see the behind the scenes. Just answering a question when you're teaching remotely, the amount of time it takes our staff to be able to do that, where the kids were in front of you, you could talk to six of them in 30 seconds as you're going through and checking that, but now you have to type out a response on Seesaw, or you have to call a parent and you have to do that. So, uh, you know, in person greatly reduces a lot of that um, because you've got the ability to communicate to people right in front of you. Efficiency, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a list of questions, so I don't, do you want me to just spew? Okay. okay. Um, so if I'm a working parent at home right now and I hear the AM, PM uh, mm -hmm. model, um, I know that you had a slide here about champions and partnerships with the park district. Mm -hmm. at, at what point is there like is there a deadline that you're thinking that you're going to be able to um, make those um, agreements with those providers and when we would be able to get that information to two families because I don't I'm, I'm not a working parent that ha has to w deal with that but I'm just wondering if that will actually play a, a role in their decision for which mm -hmm. they pick um, it may or may not, but I'm just wondering if you have a, a if you've set a timeline for yourself or for as a district when we're going to get that information to yeah, the Yeah, so so we're hoping uh, champions will be solidified within a matter of days. Um, th they're pretty close to being able to do that. Um, we need to double check and, and, and certify that we do have the available gym space in all of our schools to be able to do that at, at those particular locations. So I'm, I'm expecting that within a matter of days. The park district may require a little bit more pivot time in terms of designing a program if they're able to do so. Uh, the reason is they just designed a program and, and now they have to go back to the drawing board. So our hope is within a week we'll, we'll have um, information or those providers will be able to send information out to our, our families. One, thank you. Um, there, there was a shift um, in the fact that other districts were also not utilizing a bus monitor. Mm -hmm. um, so we're kind of shifting that check down the line. So it would be happening, am I to understand, it would be happening at the building level, like once they arrive before they actually enter the building. But this, the same processes will be in place. It just won't happen on the bus. At the bus stop, it'll happen before going in the building. That, that's correct. Um, in order to enter the building, you would have to demonstrate that you've completed the self-certification form. If you hadn't, then staff will take you through the um, symptom check and the temperature check. Uh, we will also, whether you've completed the self-certification form, unless the safety group recommends otherwise, uh, be uh, taking temperatures as well. Um, over the weekend, because I was at a lot of sporting events, um, there was talk about um, math. And I know this is going down a rabbit hole that you don't have the because we, until we have commitment, like so many things, chicken egg, all that stuff, you you won't be able to know. But that is something that is top of mind for a lot of parents in in terms of math. If their kiddo was doing the next level of math and how you're going to handle that, mm -hmm. and when they would know that information. 
So I think what we can absolutely commit to is that we will continue to have students instructed in the level of math that they are currently assigned to. And that's across the board, and it's driving some of the scheduling decisions. Now, when Kevin talked about the groupings and one of the reasons that the elementary school were moving away from a straight alpha split, some of those are considerations when we talk about academic needs of students in terms of how we will be making some of those groups happen so that we can accomplish accelerated math within the, the on-site portion of instruction, most likely. Obviously, we're, we're, we're going to make a pretty strong assumption that math will be something that we will focus on during the on-site time. And there are a number of, of plans that we actually were working through in the modified on-site model back in August that, that now, with less students and the ability to, to use some of those math um, criteria as part of our making groups, will help us to be even more successful, I believe, in delivering that on-site uh, math acceleration. It's, it does not mean, to be super clear, that we are going to be tracking elementary students in that way, but it means that, for example, in a, in a grade level, if you had, s across two classrooms, if you had six or seven students who were accelerated to the next math grade level, you could potentially bring, try to, prop, try to put those students with a, an AM preference, for example, where you might then be able to offer those six students a specific instructional experience. You might split them three and three, knowing that within the classrooms where there was the next grade level math instruction happening, there were small enough class sizes now that there will be extra seats unused by other students throughout the day where those three students could move into that classroom using a surface that's been untouched by anyone else and then move back to their classroom using the same surface that had been touched only by them, again maintaining distancing. These are a couple of examples of the ways we're beginning to start to work through it. Obviously, the guidance tells us to minimize movement, so that would be one very specific, very instructionally purposeful movement for a small group of students, still adhering to all of the six foot distancing, making sure that there are no surfaces being shared without proper cleaning. Okay, and then my, my last big one is be, as a parent of a middle school kid, a seventh grader, I had a lot of calls over the weekend and today from parents that in anticipation of tonight, and even though we've talked about um, back in September, uh, the September 14th and even in August about potential, like if we were to go back, there, there would potentially be changes and stuff. Um, can you flush out exactly the rationale, or not the rationale, but um, the reasons we cannot do um, passing periods mm -hmm. and that we're going to have to cohort the kids, yeah. unlike other districts, because again, a lot of people say, well, this district's doing it, and this district's doing it, and this district's right. doing it, and every, every district is different. Mm -hmm. Could you just, so that people at home can understand yeah, why gonna, we arrived at the situation we are in and how we, why we have to do it this way? So I want to read straight from the moderate community transmission, and here's exactly what the guidance says. Some to no mixing of groups of students and teachers throughout slash across the school day. Um, some students participate in virtual and some participate in person. And then um, again, that some to no mixing of groups. When we asked the health department, what does that mean? They said you need to cohort your students during this particular time. Even when you look at District 99, which is a high school, what they're proposing is one passing period. That's it. They're only proposing one when kids are on site. That looks much, much different. What Justin just shared with you is there could be a time during the day where kids, because of their math placement, would have to go to their, their, their math class. So I've been getting emails all day long, too, about how can you ability group kids. And we hadn't even had a chance to present what we were talking about, but yet people had, had, had drawn the conclusions. And so what, what we're saying here is we have to cohort kids to reduce the likely spread of the coronavirus. And, and, and we're following exactly what the health department is telling us to do in that particular situation. So, so that's really the rationale uh, behind that. It, it's health and safety. And um, this is where it, it, it does get complicated because, again, as Justin talked about in his portion of the presentation, a lot of the decisions that we're making, we would never make in a regular school year. It's not that we haven't thought of these things and it's not that it hasn't caused us stress or gray hairs. It's how do we prioritize health and safety number one and then in-person instruction number two and then minimizing disruptions number three. That's the batting order here that we're going off of. And, and look, I, I, I do understand that some people are gonna respectfully disagree on that particular order of how we're lining that up. Um, 
what I've committed to as the superintendent is really going back and saying, what is the guidance telling us? When I'm unclear, I ask the health department for clarification. I then talk to districts. But can I guarantee you that every district is following this as stringent as we are? No, in fact, some aren't. Uh, but most of the ones that I'm talking to is go are, are going straight from what you see on the guidance and doing their very best to implement that in the, in the terms of health and safety. So that's the rationale behind no passing periods at, at the middle school and that mixing kids for lunches at this particular time. It's straight from the guidance. So based on the guidance, even though that's not the middle school model and the way that kids are, like how we're used to doing it and that they're like, right now my son's going through and does all of his eight periods and he has different kiddos in all of his classes. He knows some and some, and he's built those relationships with people in the class. That's obviously gonna have to change now. So yeah. the, the, the point is to get him in the building. So that's just something that as a mom, for me personally as a mom, that I would have to like just understand that that's just, yeah. it is what it is. And, and Tracy, I, I get where you're coming from. I have two- <laughs> It's I very have, difficult. Look, I have two middle school daughters and one of the things that, that in our house we always talk about is the middle school is so much different it's not like the elementary school and, and please I'm not saying anything bad about the elementary experience but part of that middle school experience is building relationships with multiple teachers meeting new friends developing new circles of friends and all of that this is what I was talking about when you when you look at how hard this is in order to implement it gets really tough at the middle school level it gets really tough at the high school level because of this cohorting component and so yes in order to have in-person instruction during this pandemic you have to be more elementary like than middle school or high school like middle schools can't operate during this pandemic in a moderate transmission the same that we've always done it because of that and, and that is a sacrifice and, and i understand that one of the conversations we'll continue to have with our middle school teams though is if this is the box that we have to be defined in, what other opportunities are there for our kids to have some of those experiences virtually uh, that they can connect in with other people, that they can see other peers, you know, all those things. Matt and I were just having a brainstorming, Matt Dervala and I were having a brainstorming conversation about this very thing and we'll continue to work with our teams to come up with creative solutions on how to do those things. But yes, it is, and I understand the frustration that people have. It's not my favorite thing to recommend, but if we want in-person instruction, which so many people are calling for and really the guidance is saying we can do, this is one of those, those tough calls that we have to make. Okay, and it could be something like, it, because we have all these, um, with every board meeting there's a line item, so we can be, like that's the whole point of having this on the board agenda every month so that we can yeah. be assessing and, and having you come back to us and say, okay, we, we did it this way and f this is working or this is not working. Because mm -hmm. the middle school, unfortunately like, we talk a lot about the elementary school, but the, the middle school is a completely different animal. And, um, you know, there's a, lots of students in the, in the middle school model as well. So yeah. I just want to make sure that we got yeah. that information out. And again, going back to the, the recommendation, um, we're committed to providing the board with monthly updates. We're committed to keeping the stand agenda item um, or standing agenda item. I think the one thing that we also have to recognize is I don't anticipate that the guidance is going to stay stagnant and remain where it's at. Um, it could change, it could become less restrictive, it, be, it could become more restrictive. I think what we saw over the summer is it was becoming more restrictive. We then saw in September that there was some loosening of that, which is allowing us to have this conversation. So I can never predict where we're going to be one month from now. Okay. It sounded like you're open to that movement for math. That sounds like it's a relatively low risk when you're talking about moving a small group of kids. And I, I think may hold a tremendous amount of benefit. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? I think we want to be careful to get those final confirmations and look at the actual scheduling before we talk about sure. where, where any scheduling would exist. I, wanna, I, I think we've all been cautious to overpromise because we want to be sure that we're very clear about what we are and aren't able to do when we know those details. I, but I, I, I will agree that what we talked about was the idea of certain specific instructionally purposeful movement <clears throat> will likely be a part of some of these plans. Will it be true for all students? I, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure. But I think the other thing we want to recognize in the middle school model Model is that we are maintaining the instructional model in terms of highly qualified teachers who are endorsed in specialty areas and ensuring that those pieces are remaining consistent for 
our, our children. I mean, I'll, I'll add that I have a seventh grader at O'Neill, and so this will affect our household as well. And it, it's a decision that you, you know, we're all weighing as, as parents and as educators. And I think that we just need to keep in mind that the, the, the benefits of being on site and the fact that we do have courses at the middle school that have changed every eight weeks for <laughs> since the dawn of time. And they're, they're, not, they're the exploratory classes. It's not every class, but that's a great example of teachers being able to build and maintain classroom communities and relationships in a relatively short period of time. And, and that is another place where we can look to an example where things have been successful like that. And this is what makes this process so very hard, and I recognize it. There are so many good competing interests, right? No one is against kids making as many connections as possible at the middle school level. In fact, it's something that we promote. Most people want their kids back in school. Most people don't want teachers to have to teach to a camera and kids in class. And so as you start to check some of these boxes off, they do start to eliminate some of the other boxes here. And that, that's what's so very hard about planning for a pandemic and why there's so many feelings around this whole thing because we can't have it all during this. It, 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 it is what is so very challenging because you, you have to make some of these very tough decisions, whether it's in, in because of health and safety or whether it's because of the continuity of instruction. It, it makes it very challenging. Thank you. I have you. a question um, coming back to the um, kind of uh, what it will look like with the asynchronous on site versus, or I'm sorry, synchronous on site versus asynchronous off site instruction in the K through 6 a.m. p.m. model. Um, just to help parents in, in potentially having to make a decision should we move forward with this as a board in deciding what they would like to choose their own children with you know, on-site versus remote options. Um, for the on-site portion of the day, it's going to be focused primarily on um, English language arts, math, and social emotional, it sounds like, when they're in school with their teacher face-to-face -face in person. And then off-site, asynchronously, is going to be more focused on specials and um, social studies, science, things like that, is that correct in general? I know there's going to be some movement. Broadly speaking, I, I don't know that we can accomplish all of the science and social studies instruction that needs to happen exclusively asynchronously. So that's one of the things we'll be talking about as, as grade levels is how do we work that in so that we can, we can make sure that we are maintaining our obligation to those content areas and those standards as well in a reasonable way. So again, I, I think it's, it's certainly safe to assume English language arts, math, social emotional learning will be part of that. I don't think that we will exclude entirely science and social studies. I think that's where we'll have to make some decisions in terms of how that all fits together. Okay. And then in terms of the asynchronous, um, the asynchronous offsite portion of the day, will that look, um, in general, will it be a lot of, you know, assignments posted perhaps on Seesaw or Google Classroom or things like that? And those will be assignments that will be given, um, like through or by the students same on-site classroom teacher. So the, the teacher who is responsible for teaching the child on-site synchronously will also be giving them those assignments asynchronously off-site through Seesaw or Google Classroom or something along those lines? That so again, these are some of the details that we want to get some staff feedback on what makes this most manageable and attainable. I think part of, the, part of what I'm hearing in your question is, am I going to have a different teacher as part of that asynchronous time? And I think generally speaking, the answer to that is no. Mm -hmm. The homeroom teacher is going to be overall the, the, the person who is working with the child in all of those areas. Will the asynchronous content be specifically developed by that individual classroom teacher? Or will that be something that is more developed centrally as a district yeah. and shared out? Those are the conversations we'll be continuing to have. Okay. Because again, that goes back to the, the capacity of any one teacher to, to maintain sure. all of that. Of course. Will the assignments typically be accessed through Seesaw or Google Class or something along those lines? Or perhaps a paper, you know, like obviously the students have science and social studies student workbooks and things like that is that typically 
as you're envisioning, I guess. I know obviously these are all details that need to be worked out. And, and that's and that's exactly it. I don't yeah. want to I don't want to answer a question that's going to paint us into a planning box that we haven't yet had the chance to have some of those specific conversations. Sure. I, my my generic answer is any of that is possible. <laughs> right. But I think I would also tie back to the idea that that we now have the ability to, like you alluded to at the end, we also have the ability to hand a student something yeah. on their way to their their asynchronous or their offsite time. And so sure. I, that's where I think that asynchronous delivery is is going to evolve a little bit where we we've, we've been completely reliant on Seesaw and Google Classroom. Mm -hmm. That has its advantages, to be sure. These are tools we were using before the pandemic. But in terms of teacher feedback and back and forth, it also has its limitations if, we're now, if we now have teachers completing an entire instructional day with students on site. So I think all, I think all of that could be components of it as we go through. I think we, you know, the, the details of what that asynchronous time is going to look like is something that I, I, I do want to make sure we have a chance to work through with teachers mm -hmm. so that we are all on the same page. Okay. And then if a family were to choose the remote option, um, can you, and again, I know this is not all worked out in the details and we need a lot of teacher input and feedback and I think that is extremely invaluable. Mm -hmm. um, but can you talk just a little bit about what in, in the preliminary conversations, early conversations, what you're envisioning, what it, it sounds as though what was the online academy is not necessarily going to be what the, the remote option is going to currently look like moving forward. Can you talk just a little bit, give a little bit more detail and specifics for parents who are weighing out these options in terms of what that remote option will look like, perhaps compared to what the online academy was going to be, or perhaps compared to what remote learning is currently looking like right now? So what, what I would say is that our intent right now is that if a family were to choose the fully remote option, the portion of their day that would have been asynchronous when they were on site will be basically identical in, in, in many ways. That, that the portions of instruction that will be asynchronous for families choosing the hybrid model would also, or I should say would be offsite for the families choosing the hybrid model, mm -hmm. will also be delivered offsite for the families who are choosing the remote model, obviously. Okay. So then, what that leaves us with is trying to mirror the on-site instruction that is happening delivered remotely by a District 58 staff member. So that's, that's about as specific as I can get to mm -hmm. it right now, because again, when we get to platforms and who, and, and, and we started, you know, Kevin mentioned in the example, the potential of partnering some schools up based on the size, but that is more of the model now, so that rather than being entirely, I mean, again, it would still be potentially that A group or B group in, in some way, your group would simply be a fully remote group and we'd be delivering instruction in a similar way using District 58 content curriculum mm -hmm. materials and certified staff. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I had some uh, questions about uh, exclusionary procedures. Mm -hmm. uh, could you just speak a little bit more to how um, what would be the situation where we would be sending a student home or a family would not be sending a student to school? And what would be the expectation on that family to welcome that student back to school? So in general terms, and, and Jane, feel free to jump in if I, uh, if, if I misspeak, um, or Jessica as well. I think Jessica's back there. Um, so just for the board, we have divided um, if it is a staff member who needs to be excluded or test positive or is a close contact that goes through the personnel department if it is a student who's experiencing symptoms or needs to be excluded that goes through um, the special services department and so th that's how we're delineating those responsibilities as a school district but in general terms if a um, student is notified that they are a close contact or if um, they are experiencing a symptom there are different requirements that they would have to um, abide by uh, to, to return to school. In most cases, it is getting a negative test or a clinical uh, alternative diagnosis. And once they receive one of those or the other, uh, in most cases, if they're showing symptoms, they are allowed to come back to school. If they have been a close contact of someone who is positive, they have to wait out the 14 days as you cannot uh, test out of that because you could develop symptoms anytime during those 14 days. This is really one of the other reasons um, why we wanted a remote option that was attached to what's going on in the classrooms versus an academy because it does allow a student the ability to join the remote group so they're not sitting there for 14 days with a packet or feeling very um, disconnected. 
In terms of availability of health services, um, what we have seen from our own experiences with students and staff and what we've seen from some of our partner districts is that in general terms it, it's about a one to three day process where, where you have to go to the doctor or you get a test. Not in all cases though and that's really where we um, are combining our forces with the county uh, to, to get people access if they don't have um, insurance to be able to then go to an alternative uh, testing site. We also have a COVID-19 uh, relief fund from our um, uh, education foundation to help people with resources. But in general terms, that's where we would guide people toward the county if they're not able to come back. So I don't know if I answered your question specifically, but um, I, I that, think that's the requirement on families. That's helpful. And uh, I, I'm one of the lucky families that didn't have to go through a COVID test for any of my family members. And so just understanding that if we do roll this out, what is the actual process? Like, do I call my yeah. kid's doctor and then the doctor says, come on in, or I can diagnose you over the phone? Like, what, what, is, what should families expect? And right. maybe I member Hannah's can. I can feel this one. I've had several times. <laughs> like, Thank you, Emily. Yeah. Um, and again, this, uh, what I have found, honestly, though, um, is that it is sort of specific to your doctor, your insurance and things like that from my experience. Um, I did it two different ways with my two children um, who had to be tested in the past couple weeks. Um, one, I did go through, I called my pediatrician first. We did like an online video visit. They ordered a test and I did it very easily, very quickly in a drive-through testing procedure at one of the local offices. And that result, I think I got in two and a half days approximately. Um, with my other child who had to be tested, um, I was hoping for a quicker result because this is my one of my kiddos who is in a special program and is on site and I didn't want him to miss, I was trying to eliminate, I was fairly confident he was going to test negative and so I wanted him to uh, miss as little of his on-site education as possible so I wanted that result faster so I went to more of an urgent care, I skipped the doctor step and I went straight to an urgent care and got the test and we got that test in one, or that result in one day. Um, but I've also heard, I just received an email today from a parent who um, was just sharing information that they have insurance, they called their pediatrician and because their children were asymptomatic, they couldn't get a test. So I think that is a little bit of a concern for some families who, depending on that insurance, they might have a little bit more trouble. Even though they have insurance, they're doctor their pediatrician's office will not provide a test for asymptomatic people so if we have someone who's considered a close contact and they have to have that negative test result they are might there are there is a potential that people will have trouble getting a test well, if they are asymptomatic and that's one of the things to follow up with as far and i don't know if we can do this or if someone can do this or if that's going to be something we volunteer for but um to have i mean that's that's all fine and good that the the county has but just even here in Downers Grove, this is where our families live. Um, just even where you can go in Downers Grove, I didn't know CVS was doing it, but again, the one CVS had a shorter turnaround than another one. And so it, it was very, it's varied. It's, um, and I think it's still frustrating. And so if this is gonna be part of it, having something that at least can provide families um, a little less stressed by at least having something to start with mm -hmm. to work off of because um, yeah. maybe you can go to CVS and use your insurance uh -huh. um, and maybe that is faster than going into your you know your primary care right. but then you know mm -hmm. or it's recommended that we all check with our primary care physician and, mm -hmm. and see what that that would be but if there's something that we could that post and have available um, for Downers Grove specific areas that mm -hmm. are holding. I know that the time, you know, we could say it's a 48 hour turnaround. I don't think we'd want to put that down because that can change on yeah. a day, but just to help with the level of stress and anxiety that a family would have with the idea that they have to get their child tested if they have not, even if they have had once, your anxiety is still there, but having something for them to not have to be like, where do I go? What do I do? I can look on a list and see, okay, the CVS in Target or the whatever, I don't know who goes with what anymore, but just to have a resource list. Um, and then if they don't have insurance, where they could go, and that would be the county actual, again, 
I, you know, I've worked in crisis intervention. Not having those numbers right by you are gonna make you, your anxiety increase and you possibly do things that you normally wouldn't do. And just even having a list to work off of, mm -hmm. I think would be very helpful mm -hmm. um, that we could provide our families. So a couple, couple points to piggyback off of that. Absolutely, when a family has a child who's in this situation, our nurses will work with them and they will assist them in, in the right direction. Uh, developing a more comprehensive list in conjunction with our county health department is something that we can certainly do uh, to provide our families even more comfort. Because you're right, Jill, when, when, when someone goes through this, and I think that's why you're, why you're asking this question too, how, how can we be as supportive as possible to that, that, that family? And so um, we do have some, some positive trends that are taking place in terms of testing and people do have access, but you also hear those other stories that Emily was referring to. And so I think that that's your suggestion, Jill, too. And we could certainly beef that up um, f from our perspective as well, because our goal is to, again, maximize that in-person instruction for students. But that's also why we feel very passionate about, now that we've had a couple of months to digest this, about really trying to make sure that that remote option is strong and is available so again you don't have a kiddo who's caught in between here again our preference is to get them back in school as soon as possible but also what is that other option that we have available uh, where the online academy didn't necessarily gel well with that because they may have been over here and the on you know the in-person's over here but no jessica and i can certainly uh work on those resource lists. Um, that's the one thing that I would always give kudos to our special services department is the lists that they have in the, in the you know, connections in the community. And, and I would also tell you that just looking at the food example, our community always steps up and helps. And, and, and um, you know, I have no doubt that they will do that as well. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thanks for that info. Mm -hmm. I have another um, kind of more health and safety related question as well. In terms of the, the self-certification procedure, I know originally when we were speaking more of the modified on-site plan, we were talking about potentially like paper certificate type mm -hmm. of things. And I know obviously having um, a, a child who is on-site currently in a special program, it is a, um, what they are using is more of a Google form mm -hmm. that you fill out online every morning. What is the plan in terms of the self-certification moving forward should we move to this hybrid? Yeah, so we have three options that are available, and we're going to be going over all three of those options with our uh, safety uh, committee as we meet next week. Um, we've had a lot of success w w with the Google form, not only with staff, but also with our specialized families. Um, we're also reviewing some applications um, that anybody could have available on their cell phone, and uh, so those are some things that we're running through. The issue that we're running in with the paper is not that it's a bad system. In fact, it, sometimes it's easier because all you have to do is hold something up. The requirements keep changing. Mm -hmm. And so as you print off the paper uh, or you make a booklet, it, it could be quickly outdated. And so that's really where the, um, the, the Google form helps. And, and so right now at a minimum, we could move forward with the Google. Our families are, are, are used to that. We, we did that uh, during the transition days w with, with success. We also have the paper option available to us, but we're looking at those applications. And so um, right now, Emily, it's in that order, uh, but we are reviewing that, and um, we would have a, a finalization of that by the end of next week because those are two things that we're really uh, looking at closely with the safety committee. But at a minimum right now, if you were to ask me, well, you're starting tomorrow, what are you going to use? Mm -hmm. We would use that Google form for our families. Okay. And I know one thing that I was uh, concerned about with previous plans in terms of self-certification was when, it, when if someone comes without their certification filled out, mm -hmm. we were going to be relying on like a kind of a student self-certification yeah. conversation, and mm -hmm. that concerns me. Yeah. Uh, what are we still thinking in that direction? Have we? So it's a combination of, uh, of uh, yeah, because I have actually I, I get concerned about middle schoolers with that as well um, so the first thing that we do is we, we take their temperature we ask them to the best of their ability but we follow up with their family as well so we can't let a minor complete the whole self certification process so yes we do ask them those questions but then we follow up through the office with that family in particular to make sure that the um, guardian or emergency contact is, mm -hmm. is the one who's actually doing the, the, the self-certification, but okay. that's where the temperature checks really help because it's again, it's just that other layer of protection. Okay. My last um, kind of one along those lines is about um, 
the buses and kind of the shift in, in not having that bus monitor to verify that self-certification. Um, we're, we're kind of admitting as, as a district that that's the one area that we will not be able to ensure social distancing is on the buses. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we're um, like accepting students onto those buses without knowing whether their certification forms have been completed and things like that. And that's slightly a little concerning to me in terms of, you know, from a health, health and safety perspective, you know, this is the one place where we're already admitting we can't guarantee the social distance is going to be followed. And we also don't know for sure that those students have self-certified and are symptom free and, and things like that. So that's a little worrisome to me. I understand that the bus monitoring is a, is a tricky logistical thing to accomplish. Um, and I understand, you know, the, the rationale behind that, but it also concerns me a little bit from a health and safety standpoint that we can't guarantee six foot social distancing and we also are not sure that those students are symptom free when they get on that bus. So that's a little worrisome to me just, just from that standpoint, just as kind of a comment, I guess, more than a question. Mm -hmm. um, well, but let me just, yeah. just jump in. One of the things that we can do with our bus riders is see when families are filling out that form though. And if a child is riding the bus and that form doesn't get filled out, again, I don't want anyone on the board to think that we're just, and I'm not suggesting you were saying this, mm -hmm. um, we're not going to passively sit by. And so we are going to be back in touch with those families. We sure. are going to be talking to them. If your child is going to ride the bus, here are the requirements. You have to self-certify before they get on the bus. So there are things, and again, that's where the Google form or an app really comes in handy mm -hmm. because you can track when they're filling that out. And mm -hmm. so um, there are things that we can do as a school district to actively uh, monitor that mm -hmm. uh, to, to make sure that people are adhering to that. Okay. Uh, there are also different levers we can um, push, not that we ever want to discipline uh, in this kind of situation, but if a family is being non-compliant with mm -hmm. that, we do have different levers that we can pull as a sure. school district. Of course. With the short, um, with the, the AMPM model, mm -hmm. um, the students are only there for, is it two and a half hours? Is that mm -hmm. correct? Are we, and obviously in that model there is no lunch, which is I yep. think good from a health and safety perspective, are we eliminating the snack? as well since it's only two and a half hours in the two and a half hour model uh, I, I don't think we'll ever say that a, a child's never going to have a snack in there because each okay. child is a little bit different sure. but it's not set up with a built-in um, snack time the middle school is different when you have four hours of, mm -hmm. of kids being there mm -hmm. um, and again we're going to continue to work through that with our safety team okay. uh, but we're not designing the elementary with the need for a snack because it is a two and a half hour time frame okay I have some others, but we'll go back to Okay, uh, I'll jump in. Um, so I'm looking at this slide. Um, it has to do with feedback from the staff, and I guess that's the one thing I'm curious about. The one thing I didn't, I wanted to see in there, but I didn't see um, was, um, I guess it's just thinking about something specifically, but I'm sure there's other things I'm not thinking about currently. To what extent did the, the staff feel that their own, um, that some of their professional needs are being met under this model? For example, um, not having a lunch um, it built into the middle school model, um, are they, do they feel um, confident that their contraction needs are being met uh, in terms of having the appropriate amount of plan time, having the 30 minutes of duty-free lunch? Um, additionally, another need that I just want to make sure that they feel is being met is their own professional development needs um, in terms of being able, not just um, like formal and informal opportunities to, to not just to be better prepared as educators in general, but also better prepared to be hybrid educators. So do they, I, just, I, felt, I guess I feel like does this, do they feel like they're supporting this model to have certain needs met, like, a, like, some, like some of the ones I was suggesting and, and others? So I, I, I again want to be clear that this feedback was initial, right? Mm -hmm. These, the faculty meetings were 30 to 45 minutes, maybe an hour in length in some cases. And so by the time staff had a chance to digest the two models, uh, we were really asking for that higher level feedback of what do you see as benefits of this model? What do you see as systems and support structures that would need to be built in to make sure that this model is successful? That's really how we cultivated the feedback. So I, I don't know that I, I don't want to try to answer that question tonight because I don't I don't think we have that level of feedback from staff at this point because okay. to be sure they haven't seen the details of what that schedule is going to look sure. like. So I, I appreciate that. I mean in terms of professional learning we've got some other venues where we've asked those questions and certainly there is a balance of you know 
we are we are feeling like there are some things that are going well and we're getting the support we need. There are some places where we feel like there's never going to be enough time and we're and we're certainly feeling day to day. I mean, I you know that we had grade level meetings today and those are, that's, that that feedback varies. We need to continue to try to carve out that time and obviously we know we're not going to be subbing people out of the classrooms right now for additional meetings and things like that. So on the professional learning side, I can tell you the feedback is mixed. In terms of the schedules, obviously, you know, duty free lunch is something that needs to be in there for staff. The rest of it, there just hasn't really been a chance to get to that level of detail where we could, where I could confidently answer that question. Okay. Um, second question is, um, Kevin, you talk about how you're, you're discussing um, the models in your, those four districts you listed, mm -hmm. um, North Shore, Center Cass, et cetera. Uh, my question is around, you know, I was thinking about how within a few days time at the beginning of the school year, we had 42 kids who um, um, exhibited one or more COVID symptoms. Thankfully, they all tested negative. Yeah. But in, a, in those districts that have been on site all along, mm -hmm. when students are coming in with a symptom and they, they very, may very well be COVID negative, what is the, the level of interruption like in the classroom? What is the, how, how much does that impact nurses, teachers, administrators? Um, has it been something that's manageable or is it some, has it been something that has been, there's a lot of triaging going on? Um, there's a lot of triaging going on. Uh, and again, I can tell you as the superintendent, there are days that I can't get to things, um, like during those transition days or, or Jane's office. Um, so there's a lot of triaging, but we are getting better at it as we go through. So for instance, I, I just talked about how we have clear systems now in our personnel department. We have clear systems um, with our student services department. Jessica and I just met with uh, one of our coordinators last week and we're assigning her as the person who is the go-to for all of these questions. And so we're starting to work a lot smarter with this, um, but make no mistake about it, it requires a lot of communication, a lot of follow-up, um, talking with individuals. So um, it, it, it's not a small feat, but the more you experience this, the, the better you, you get at those things. Um, but it is a layer added on to all of the other things that you do in a school year that, that is, it, it's quite complex and it does add on a lot of uh, time. Again, I'll, I'll stand by my statement that I think it's all worth it. Um, so, so I don't want anybody to interpret this as, as complaining uh, because it's one of those things in a unique year that you know, we ask our staff to step all, up all the time. I'm very proud of our administrative staff for how they've stepped up and continue to step up and we'll do that to do whatever it takes to get through this. Okay. Um, and then I just want to have one more question. Thankfully, um, Darren and Tracy asked some of my big ones already. So um, good efficiency there. Um, Kevin, um, in terms of your role as superintendent, in my, in my opinion, one of the biggest parts of your job is that, that uh, stakeholder, or stakeholder um, accountability piece. Uh -huh. Tell me how, um, upon implementing this plan, how are you going to gather feedback and make adjustments in terms of making sure we are living within that, that model of continuous improvement? Yeah, so um, on so many different levels, but one of the things that we are committed to is going back uh, both formally and informally with our parents and, uh, or excuse me, our families, and then also with our staff. And so formally, obviously one of the easiest things you can do is to send a survey. Uh, I, I think I'll speak for most people in the community. I think we have to be careful with how many surveys we're sending out. Uh, one of the comments I read loud and clear on the last one was on the survey was, <laughs> stop sending me surveys, right? And, and so um, I get it, I hear you. Uh, you know, so, so I think we, we have to be careful with that. Uh, but one of the other things, if, if you know, or, or if you recall the timing now, we have other groups that can help provide feedback. So Superintendent's Community Advisory Council starts. That, that's a great group for me, and they always give me really, really good solid feedback. Um, I know many uh, of our associations are here, um, so we gather feedback from our staff in many ways. What, one of the things that we do is we meet with the leadership regularly, uh, whether that's in individual meetings or collectively as a whole, we're, we're committed to doing that. Uh, but we get a lot of really good feedback um, from our weekly staff meetings that the principals then come and they have our meetings. And, and, and so we do get a lot of stakeholder input. Um, that's one thing that I'm extremely proud of in this district. And not only that we get the input, but that we make that input <coughs> available uh, for everyone. So we are committed to getting that stakeholder feedback through all of the, uh, the various avenues. And then you will be updated as a board through our weekly updates, but then also at meetings about where we're at in the superintendent's report. But, we're committed to doing that. Do you think we have to be careful though? 
about how many things we're, we're asking our families to do because you're going to get the negative turn on that saying that they're not going to you know participate in that anymore okay thank you mm -hmm. I, I just had one quick question and kind of just ties into what emily asked about asynchronous i guess as i look back through the communication timeline and, and the dates of supporting the transition when would parents have a better idea of what asynchronous would look like you know, when their kids showed up back at 1050 back at home, like, are they going to have that um, better idea before they make the commitment? Or are we going to have to wait till those um, planning days, the, the 16th and the 19th to answer that question? I, I think it's a, at, at best somewhere in between. I don't, I don't think we'll be able to commit to the idea that we would have an asynchronous sample schedule available by October 5th. I think they're, again, because some of that planning still, it, it's the, it's the catch 22. Some of the planning for how many sections will we have? How will we deliver those, those specials classes? What will all that look like? Part of it is, is those commitments. Part of it is the timing of being able to have some of those conversations with teachers. I mean, right now we're, we're looking at asking teachers to volunteer time well outside of the instructional day to have those conversations over the course of the next week and a half or so. So I think realistically, you know, I, w I would hope that we'd be able to be providing some of that at or around the time of the transition of those planning days, um, and, you know, as we have in the past, kind of trying to give families as, as, as clear of an advanced picture as we can. But again, I, I think that we want to, we will try to get to, uh, there, there will be some specific commitments, there will be some of it that will be independent and less requirement on specific times as that as it that is right now in terms of the asynchronous pieces All right. well, well I, I definitely appreciate that the candid response but I, I think we need to push that that realistic viewpoint a little bit more to maybe have a more detailed answer than no answer at all um, ahead of the commitment yeah in, in, in what, what I think we're, we're saying is that you you got we, we have some opportunities first opportunities we're going to have is, is an FAQ that we'll send right. out where we can outline some of those things um, again though to, to Justin's point we have to be careful that um, we allow our staff to have input I think one of the things we, we hear from our community we hear from our board is that make sure you're hearing the voice of our staff make sure that they have a, a chance to have that input then I think you have different benchmarks with these Friday communications that we talked about you've got your a and notification on the night you've got schedules coming out on the 16th and each one of those is an opportunity to continue to update our community on where we're at and what this is going to, to look like. But I think we're gonna have some broad things ready in the FAQ, again, not getting too, too specific, but giving parents enough. Uh, the one thing I would say in terms of making a decision, keep in mind that, that it's going to look the same for those families that do the remote option as well as the in-person option in terms of how much time is gonna be synchronous and how much time is gonna be asynchronous because it's really designed to be the same thing. And so in terms of families who are making their decision, um, really that time is gonna look the same in both models. Okay. Kind of feeding a little bit off of that question um, in terms of when people will be notified of certain things, more from the teacher standpoint. Um, do, is there any, any thought being given to when teachers might be assigned, perhaps if their assignment is going to change or they might be assigned to be a remote teacher versus an in-person teacher, et cetera? Is there any just, you know, kind of picking off also off of what Greg said about making sure that our teachers are supported and given what they need, time to prepare, those types of things. Have we worked through that timeline a little bit? Um, yes, definitely. There, I've actually already reached out to a couple staff members who we preliminarily have identified um, that we would anticipate for sure we're going to need to shift their position. Um, and then pretty quickly here, really I'll be meeting with each building administrator on October 5th and 6th to go through the staffing, look across district-wide, and then start communications immediately with staff early again on the 5th, 6th, 7th, so that same week. Um, but some of our the, the staff members who we spoke to previously in anticipation that we might need to pull them and we were going to be going back to those same people mm -hmm. first. Okay. Um, but then, yeah, we, we definitely want people to have time to start um, joining those grade level teams, maybe observing, maybe joining some of the remote lessons, and then be prepared to go right into the planning days to be fully prepared. Thank you. I just have quick two things one yeah. this isn't um, it's more of an ask uh, when you were talking about the administration you know there's priorities now um, 
in the world of disaster, we call it blue sky, gray sky. So right now everyone's kind of operating in a gray sky. Mm -hmm. I'm really asking families um, when we choose to go back, um, but I also think that it is very important even right now. Um, if you haven't joined your local PTA, your school PTA, um, I ask you to do so. And if um, you have, instead of just being, you know, hey, everybody sign up so that that classroom can get a pizza, I think now more than ever, um, if there's things that teachers or administration within each building could need, could ask for support um, from their families, as long as it's not anything where they're breaking confidentiality. We have our families, um, we have parents um, that can step up and really be that support system for, um, and really continue what we value in this community, which is our community schools, and really come um, stand up for uh, our kids and uh, to support the teachers. I know the PTA already does that, but I think there is there is more that needs to be done. Um, and on a second thing, just because I can say this, um, we had our curriculum night for O'Neill uh, Tuesday, no, last Wednesday. Um, I did end up in a wrong classroom. I did end up late. Um, so just zooming is is a real is a real thing. Struggles real. The struggle <laughs> is real. I felt like I was in college again. I'm like I am in the wrong room. Um, but I already told Matt uh, there was such a level of that first day of school excitement that I hadn't gotten yet, and being just on Zoom calls with the teachers and the staff and their level of excitement um, was catchy. It was so amazing to see other parents and families that I have not seen since um, last spring. And I know that Zoom isn't the best thing, but um, it, I just wanted to thank Matt again publicly. Um, and I know that this happened in other schools that held their curriculum nights, but that level of Oh my gosh, it's the first day of school because at middle school, I was not allowed to to be there for her. my daughter. She did not want to be there. Um, and especially just personally, there's a very, very pleased and such an excited grandfather um, <laughs> who is so thrilled to have his first grandchild at the school that he taught for at for 35 years. And just I'm so excited for the school year and being part of the O'Neill family when I really thought that S Samantha should never leave Fairmont. So <laughs> thank you. One of the other things too that I would encourage everyone to do, and I know this is kind of going off a little bit, um, even if you're not on Twitter, to at least look at some of the things that our staff posts on Twitter. They do an amazing job telling the story of what's taking place in our schools. And if you need that pick me up, if you need an <laughs> excitement, um, you will certainly find that every day on the hashtag DG58Pride. There's a lot of really great things going on in our school district. And uh, a lot of our staff are utilizing that medium to show people. And I think it's a really good way to uh, communicate to our community. So if you get a chance, take a look at that because you'll see a lot of these feel good stories out there. And, and that is, you know, one thing that I, I would share over and over again as the superintendent. No matter what we are dealing with here in Downers Grove 58, the end product remains the same. Our teachers are dedicated, our support staff is dedicated, our administrators are dedicated. You're gonna continue to get everybody's very best no matter what here in the school district. No matter what these different learning uh, scenarios look like, you're going to get the very best um, from us and we're committed to continuing to go back and asking for that feedback and making those adjustments. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? I, I, had, I had one about assessment. I know that this is around the time we would have been doing map assessment for the fall, likely remote. Now with the potential for transitioning to on-site, is the plan to postpone fall assessments to later when students are back in school or to still conduct it over the next couple of weeks? What does that look like? So we are going to maintain the fall map assessment window for grades three through eight to be accomplished remotely. 
we actually, the window technically opened today, <coughs> and we had, I believe, six classrooms across the district, six or seven, um, offer to go first so we could learn what that experience would be like before we attempted it wholesale. The majority of schools will begin um, next week or late, much later this week in terms of moving through that. Part of the reason for maintaining that um, for three through eight is because we need to maintain a certain distance between fall assessment and winter assessment in order to obtain growth scores from fall to winter. So that's the, the, the reasoning behind three through eight. The reason, I'm sorry, two through eight. I, I, I keep separating it incorrectly and I, I did that in the communication earlier to staff. So grades <laughs> two through eight will be taking the MAP assessment remotely. Kindergarten and first grade, because the assessment is an auditory assessment where they are listening via headphones, doing that remotely requires with our iPads that they would have to disconnect from every other app on their iPad, whereas in grades two through eight, they could have a second Zoom screen open and things like that to be able to communicate with teachers. Kindergartners and first graders who will have either never taken the assessment or taken it once but certainly not remember it would, would be completely isolated in that sense. And so the amount of reliance on at home or, or wherever they may be help against the, the reliability really of what that would be. We are going to postpone the K-1 MAP assessment until we are on site and, and make some decisions around that at that time. I had one question I forgot. It came up at a baseball game over the weekend. Um, and this only relates to Highland and Lester, but mm -hmm. with the return to learn plan that it still would they still would remain in Bel Air and Pierce Downer, is that correct? That that is correct. Uh, it, as much as we would wish that we could have the room for them, um, there there simply isn't because of the extra sections, especially for kindergarten, uh, to make that a half day. So there there still is not room there uh, to, to make that happen. Um, we tried every which way to make it work, uh, but with the, the extra COVID spaces needed when you have to um, have a classroom go because someone is symptomatic. So again, we looked at it every single way and just aren't able to make that work at this time. But it is certainly only a temporary thing during the pandemic. And then um, once we return to normal operating procedures, those children will return back to their home schools. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One more, for uh, special programs, DLP, BEST and RISE, they will continue to run the same scheduling time frame that they have been all along, even if we shift to a hybrid model, or they'll, their times will change. So in looking at how we're currently set up, there will there will be minimal shift that has to happen for most programs. I think like, like we've talked about in other instances, the middle school model uh, is going to present some challenges. So when we talked about having to do some individual problem solving, in particular, we're gonna to have to do some focused work there. So we'll be working with our staff members to try and figure out how we can set that up that's least impactful to our families as well. Well, thank you to everybody on the board. Um, and, and this is why I, I, I didn't go through all my questions. Like we are, there's a lot of, um, we, are, we are in sync really well tonight because every other question I had on my sheet did get ticked off. So. Um, so I thank you for that. I did want to take a, a moment and say um, that, again, I, I said I, I spoke with a lot of our, our, our teaching staff recently, and what I found amazing in, in speaking with them is, is how in sync they were with our families in recognizing what our, our, our students need and just hearing them talk about our kids and what it was like communicating with them and the desire to have them in front of them and how impactful those those transition days were um, it was very meaningful because those transition days I know for me were were really great and uh, I, I, I several of us talked about those days in the last meeting so I just want to say um, we're hearing you and I know everybody's circumstances are slightly different none of us are going to be happy with this situation I you know I guarantee you that the conversations that go into my house like um, there's gonna be just as much disappointment as there is excitement. Everybody in, in my household is, is dying to get back uh, as many hours as they can in, in front of their teacher. Um, and, I, and, and Dr. Russell, you commented about uh, being married to a, a teacher. I've, I've, my, my wife's a teacher as well. I've never seen so much effort go into it. And so the one thing I would call for, and, and, and you acknowledge this in the fact that this plan really is mapped through winter break is yes we may have to make some tweaks and make some changes but to really communicate well um, when we need to do those and to try to, to limit those up through the end of, of, of the calendar year here because I think the hardest part of the, the teachers that I have in, in my life is, is friends and family 
uh, is every moment that we have of uncertainty in, in building a plan for how to teach their, their kids is I think the, the biggest challenge that we have. So communication is going to be just so huge through this to our staff, to our families and everybody else. But I, when I came in to meet with you to put the agenda together, you know, I, I saw Justin rolling in awfully late at night, uh, wrapping up his day. I, you know, uh, we've talked about some of the schedules that people have been running um, in every, you know, from your administration, you know, all the way down to the building level. Uh, the I see cars in Lester parking lot late at night. Uh, so, just to everybody for all the level of work that that's been going on. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And that. Again, I don't think the public sees that from the Board of Education perspective, uh, but if we were to log our, our phone minutes on all of our cell phones, I'm sure they would be in, in the days and weeks now. Uh, there's a lot of effort really going on in the school district on, on, on all sides, and um, that's the one thing that I just want to, again, commend all of our staff for their hard work and then continue to ask that we're not always going to agree on everything, whether it's a board and the superintendent or whether it's the staff, but to continue to dialogue with one another so we can problem solve and continue to move forward. That's what good organizations do in good times and tough times. And if we continue to do that, we'll, we'll really walk in the right direction. Thank you. All right, before we go into public comment, is there anyone that needs a five minute break? All right, let's take a, a five minute and then we'll go into public comment. It is now time for uh, public comment. The board has allocated 60 minutes for this opportunity for the board and the, and the community uh, to communicate. We have asked you that you keep your comments to three minute limit to allow everyone the opportunity to speak. At this time, I have received, uh, I think four, let me double check, four cards. Uh, we ask that each of you who submitted a card to please come to the podium, state your name and your attendance area, and then provide your public comment. After all, those who have submitted a card have had a chance to speak, we will play those comments submitted remotely. Should there be any time remaining, we will then take any additional in-person comments. All right, Ami Johansson from Pierce Downer. Welcome. So I just had three things to say. Um, one, I wanted to thank the administration, the teachers, everyone who had put together this remote schedule. It has been truly amazing to see my son, who's in second grade, and my daughter, who's in kindergarten, go through this and learn so much like this. It has been night and day from the spring. Um, I just want to thank you all for all the work I know must have gone into this. Um, the second is kind of a piggyback on that. So as we go and are heading toward in-person, um, the asynchronous time worries me because you have found a way to make the synchronous time and the asynchronous time and synchronous time work so well right now that I feel like we're gonna head back to spring <laughs> where we were just left to do things for hours at a time, which sounds okay, but for, families who have two parents who are working at the same time and trying to manage this while working, um, it leaves a lot of things not done. And then we're at night and we're at five o'clock trying to do these things when we're done with work and it just adds a lot of stress to us. So I, w I really hope we take the lessons, whatever you have done right now, and take them into the asynchronous time that you're planning for when we're in person because it really has worked for us who are two working parents. Um, and that's the last thing I wanted to talk about. So this in-person model sounds so fabulous to get our kids back to school. I do want to everyone to recognize the, the burden this is placing on parents who are both working. Um, we, our entire system of care for our kids is going to have to change dramatically. Um, there are no babysitters anymore. If you have ever tried to hire a babysitter right now, there's no one. Um, so there are, I, I am here tonight because my uh, in-laws take care of my kids and they actually have to keep them overnight because they live an hour away. So clearly they're not going to be able to do it when my kids are in person. And so this is asking a lot of working parents to be able to do this. Um, Champions is great, but to do it before or after, that's about an hour of care when you might need like six hours of care. Um, so 
I just want you to like think about this as w what parents are going to have to do to make this work and giving us maybe five to ten days to put it all together is a lot I just would like just to recognize that if you tell us that we're in the p.m. section now we have to have a morning care or if we're in the a.m. section now we have to have afternoon care you gave us ten days to figure this out there are no babysitters I have talked to many parents like there is there's just no one left because um, everyone's in this situation. They're all gone. Um, that's basically what I wanted to say to me. Thank you very much. Angelique Stacy from Lester and Herrick. Hi, my name is Angelique Stacy. I'm a Downers Grove resident. I'm also a parent of a child at Lester and at Herrick. Hi, Miss Reed. <laughs> I want to start by saying thank you very much to Dr. Russell and to the administrators and teachers for their countless hours being devoted toward lessons online and considering a safe return. So I appreciate it. I know this is a thankless job. That being said, I'm also here as an advocate tonight, not just for my children's education, but for their mental health too. My fifth grade son wakes up every morning on Monday, tearful and hopeless. He loved school. He was a teacher's pet. He was full of charisma, and now he is despondent. Homework is missing daily, even with check-ins and diligence. His teacher is excellent. She is trying her best. But his last full day of school was seven months ago. I can't do it anymore, Mom. I tell him it's temporary. You'll be back in school soon, and you're doing great. I keep it positive. He asks me if we have a lot of COVID around us. I tell him levels are relatively low, but they're moderate. I saw a statistic. They were 83 cases out of a million people. That was a few days ago. I don't know what that is now. But I'm running out of things to explain to him about why he's staring at a screen for hours. Daily headaches. My eighth grader has a 504. His plan consists of eight Zooms and then occupational therapy and a counseling Zoom. He needs in person, but he doesn't have an IEP. He needs more, he needs less Zooms and more in person to succeed. I sat through Herrick's curriculum night and I don't have ADHD and I wiggled through the whole thing. I don't know how our kids are doing it, and I give them props, too. In DuPage County, cases of 0 to 19-year-olds are at an all-time low, and studies finding that transmission rates of student to teacher are rare and sometimes non-existent. But my kids don't care. They care about connecting with their teachers and seeing responses in person, learning with friends, even from a six-foot distance, learning and growing and thriving, not just surviving. I'm a two-person household, and my husband and I work both full-time, and I understand your struggles. English is our primary language, and we struggle with connectivity, and we have every resource available. We are lucky. I can't imagine what families are going through with struggling with connectivity, scheduling, English as a second language, or a one-parent or essential worker household. So I respectfully ask that District 58 open our schools as soon as possible, give our choice back that we the 66 percent that voted for in person thought we would have a month ago and trust parents to be diligent in enforcing your policies as we have shown during the transition days our children are paying a price schools exist for them and we want to to champion them there have been loud vocal voices that have been heard i am my kids union I am my kid's voice. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you. Thank you. Megan Winthrop, uh, Herrick. Hi, my name is Megan Winthrop, and I am an eighth grade ELA teacher at Herrick Middle School and a District 58 parent. I've been teaching there for 17 years, and my passion for teaching has 
and always will be with the students. I'm here tonight to share a teacher's perspective of how remote learning is going and to ask you to really consider how changing the schedule now may affect our students. Remote learning has been no easy task on students, parents, or teachers, but we've done it. We've tirelessly planned together and adapted curriculum, learned the ins and outs of Zooming and breakout rooms, and how to screen share iPads. We've come together as departments and as staff to share ideas and help one another out. It took us a minute, but I think most of us can finally say we've got this. As a teacher, my main concerns are developing relationships with my students, setting expectations, and of course, teaching the curriculum. My students have been rock stars. They are coming to class on time. They are participating. They are asking questions and forming a classroom community. Those students that may be struggling in certain areas are reaching out or I'm able to check in on them because we have forged relationships these past few weeks. This is no easy feat, but I believe it is the most important quality of middle school. My colleagues would agree with me when I say that social emotional learning comes from relationships, not scripted curriculum. As a school, most of us would say that we are finally able to really dig into our curriculum and teach required skills and standards. We're able to differentiate and meet in small groups. We're able to conference individually with students. If you ask any middle school teacher, we love this age. They are unique learners. They are unlike their elementary peers who may need more hands-on work or their high school peers who may le learn more independently. This is why we love them. And this is also why middle school should be looked at separately from elementary schools. I would ask the board to consider the progress we as a middle school have made in the past few weeks and to phase in the middle school return to learn protocol at the end of the trimester. Coming back mid trimester will mean teacher and schedule changes for students and an interruption of learning. Our students have already been through enough uncertainty the past eight months and the least we can do is give them a solid trimester to work on building the foundational skills that we've been working on. Reteaching expectations, team building, and a general level of comfort in a new classroom in the middle of a trimester is more disruptive than waiting for the beginning of a new grading period, which would be a more natural transition. With the proposal of conferences being at the end of the trimester, it makes logical sense to align everything with the end. This would alleviate multiple teachers having to report out on report cards or sitting in on Zoom conferences. I want to teach in person and see my students, but not at the risk of harming relationships and having to start overs. Whatever decision is made tonight, I hope you truly consider the social emotional implications on our middle school students over the rush to get back into the building. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Craig Young, DGEA. <clears throat> Thank you, my name is Craig Young. I teach fourth grade at Kingsley and I serve as the president of the DGEEA. I just wanna share views on our recommendation tonight. Uh, I wanna begin by saying thank you to administration and board for providing all of our teachers with an opportunity to give feedback on the, the proposal that was made tonight uh, and for collaborating with the DGEEA and preparing the administrative recommendation. Uh, I wanna stress that our teachers have proven themselves to be driven, hardworking professionals We've heard a ton of examples tonight. I'm not gonna belabor the point, um, but I, I think Dr. Russell's comment that we are hitting it out of the park right now uh, really helps to encapsulate the effort that has gone into this year. Um, I, I, I know there are a lot of parts of this plan that we do agree with. Um, we're excited that we'll be able to see our students in, in the classroom. Um, and I believe that seeing all of our students every day at the elementary level, that continuity will be beneficial. Um, in addition, there are many students who are gonna benefit from being physically present with a teacher um, for lessons in the core curriculum areas, but being able to see and interact with their teacher in person will allow many to find more success than they're able to do in remote learning, no question. Uh, we're also very supportive of focusing our efforts on one instructional mode at a time. Trying to teach some students on a screen while others are in person um, is just not able to be done well. Uh, and we, we want to be at our most effective, uh, both in person and remotely. And so we very much agree with the idea of, of staying with that one mode at a time. 
Um, I really like the transition plan. I think it's very well thought out. Having the two days, two planning days, uh, to allow us to prepare for the new instructional model, that will allow us to create a better experience for our students. And then having that school improvement day following, uh, the first few days in the new model will allow teachers to reflect and collaborate to build on strengths and shore up weaknesses that we see in those first few days. Uh, moving conferences to uh, later on, um, maybe after the end of that first trimester, I think is a really logical shift. It will allow us to use that opportunity to really connect and communicate with our students and their families uh, to both provide and receive that important feedback. Um, but as you're making this decision tonight, uh, we really just want to make sure that you've got those, that eyes wide open approach. And the discussion I've heard tonight is, has really shown me that that, that, uh, that eyes wide open approach has already been taken. Uh, but I just want to highlight a few of the things that we see changing a as we move into a new instructional model. Uh, and I want to preface this by saying that uh, the teachers in, in our district are going to work hard regardless of what model we're in. Um, but I do want the, the decision makers in our district to understand, you know, what's going to change. And again, you've brought up a lot of these um, already today and, and other speakers have as well. Uh, but that amount of student contact time that we're able to deliver to our elementary students right now um, is just not going to be possible w with this new model. Uh, by only working with half of our class at a time, we're only going to be able to spend half as much time with each portion compared to what we were able to provide in the current model. That asynchronous time is going to look different. Um, and, and we can certainly problem solve and work through it as much as we can. But it, I'm, it's not possible to be on Zoom and w working with students in person at the same time. That solution is just a non-starter. So it's definitely going to look different. Uh, differentiation is also a piece that's going to have to look different. What our teachers have been able to do with the breakout rooms in Zoom in order to provide that, those differentiated groups uh, and address students' needs just can't look the same in on-site classrooms uh, because of the limited mobility and the six-foot distancing. Um, it's just it, it's not school like we're used to. It's not school as we know it. It's just going to look, uh, feel, and sound very different. Uh, same thing with the hands-on small group experiences in classes like, like science or middle school exploratories. Uh, it's just going to be different. Um, during remote learning, students are able to stand up, stretch, maybe walk around a bit during class. Again, that's going to be something that we're going to have to change as we move into an on-site model. Um, the, the reassignment of teachers and, uh, with, with students and then the changing of the complex schedules uh, around all the support pieces we have, reading support, math support, social work, speech, OT, et cetera, all those pieces um, and the scheduling issues there uh, that will just have to be redone and reworked um, and, and find a way to make it work. Um, so again, and there, there is a lot on the plan that we really like. It's, we are supportive of much of this plan. Uh, but as teachers, we simply want to make sure that as you're voting tonight, you have that eyes wide open approach, really understand uh, what your decision tonight will mean. Um, regardless, you know, working within these guidelines set forth by IDPH means we do, we have to change everything we do. The way we teach, uh, the way that our students learn, uh, it just changes the whole, the whole in-person experience. Uh, but I promise you we will support your decision tonight, whatever it might be. We will make it work to the very best of our ability because we're here for the children of District 58. Uh, they have been and continue to be our top priority. So thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, Craig. All right, that's it for our cards tonight. We do have some public comment from outside. So at this time, we're going to go ahead and play any public comments that have been submitted remotely. How many do we have? Nine. Nine. Okay. Hello, my name is Victoria O'Boyle, and my children attend Luster and Herrick Middle School. Dr. Russell and... Can you just restart it? And then you kind of, you kind of faded in at the beginning. Hello, my name is Victoria O'Boyle, and my children attend Luster and Herrick Middle School. Dr. Russell and Downers Grove 58 Board of Education, I respectfully speak to you today to share my concerns about our current return to learn plan as it stands. I have two children in the district, as I stated, one in seventh and one in third grade. I understand the severity of the pandemic, but the question still remains why can other DuPage County schools open and District 58 schools are not? 
I ask you this for reasons, um, for my personal reasons, as I'm seeing my own children experience some emotional distress as a result of remote learning. One child is exhibiting some OCD behaviors. Um, the other child is pretty disengaged from the Zoom activities and the executive function skills that um, are required to go between um, the different workbooks and activities. Um, I feel like their self-esteem is taking a hit when we try to work with our children in the evening, um, and this concerns me. I applaud the efforts of the teachers of um, my children, and but as two working parents, this does not make a positive remote learning experience for my children personally. I understand this may not be the case for other families. I'm an educator in DuPage County that is fully open all day with lunch. I'm fully able and willing to help my children succeed, um, although it is a continued struggle uh, as I advocate for my own school so that it is open and that we can provide our families with a safe um, learning environment for children. But other parents without the educational backgrounds or don't have the luxury, um, I can only imagine how that must feel in their household since I am personally struggling. Not only is this remote learning experience diminishing my children's love for learning, it is lowering their self-esteem and their ability to communicate effectively. Um, I feel like we're also learning some not so great learning habits at home, turning in things that aren't really completely done. And yet again, I understand that that may be a child um, particular experience. However, as an eight-year-old, that is not typically something they're all not going to try to be perfect and turn in the perfect paper. So I feel like our work habits are kind of not being sacrificed during remote learning. I'd like to know um, what exactly the criteria that is going to be used to determine a safe return to school. Um, why did we shift to remote learning when we were in the lowest transmission level when other districts in our area opened? The only time we're really going to be safe from COVID is if we have herd immunity. It is not reassuring for me to hear that administration say that we will return to in-person learning when it is safe. This will not occur for a long time if logic serves me. We may be living with COVID-19 for the unforeseeable future. Does this mean that kids won't get to go back in person or experience a full day of school? Isn't it time we figure out how to keep kids in school using the restrictions put in place by the health agencies that we seek to advise us? In August, 75% of our parents wanted in-person instruction. This means that parents wanted and are willing to teach their children how to wear masks, remain distant from others, and wash their hands and follow whatever the restrictions were that needed to be put in place. I'm certain the PTO would get behind our efforts in helping um, children return to classrooms. The current transmission rate in DuPage County was 4.7 this weekend when I looked on Saturday. How can we say that we can't have students in school with such a low rate? Student schools in Will County remained in school while the region state was above the 8%. Additionally, the state itself does not have plans to close schools when the rate increases. Instead, the CDC, as well as other health agencies, including the DuPage County Health Department, have developed rubrics to assess this transmission and help schools determine their viability for being open. So when we take a look at the CDC indicators and thresholds for risk of introduction and transmission of COVID-19 in schools, it says that we are at a low risk. Please explain why our district remains in a solid remote learning plan when other districts in our county can open. I, um, implore you to consider bringing our children back into school and help families during this time of need. Thank you and respectfully. This is Allison Rosell um, with Hillcrest Attendance Area. Um, my two concerns are one, um, getting back to the in-person learning and two, remotely, um, I'm noticing that the specials as planned are not getting um, any live time to teach and I'm wondering how that will move going forward um, you know like my daughter said art class isn't art class anymore I mean she doesn't go not let alone like they can't be in person using supplies but um, in addition I'm just concerned about other aspects of remote teaching and you know is it a fair and equal education 
um, for everyone in Illinois if some districts are already attending sometimes and some are not. Um, and I'm just wondering, when I looked at the grid and saw that it looked like we could be in hybrid already while we're actually in remote right now, so I'm a little concerned that it seems like we're meeting the least we possibly can under the state guidance, and I'm looking for us to meet the most we possibly can. I think teachers and students would enjoy it, and I think that kids need to get back in as much as possible, and it's realistic, I feel, that they can um, wear the mask, take mask breaks, and at least be half in at a time. Um, and, you know, I, just, I hope things that move forward and they get more time with specials um, so that they can have some of those things that make them interested in school um, back. And also the social piece is very important as well, and that's very hard to accomplish remotely. I look forward to um, our kids getting back to school soon. My name is Chelsea Foreman, and I'm a mother of a second grader at Kingsley Elementary School. During remote learning, we have had the most wonderful experiences with her teachers trying so hard remotely. I, as an educator myself, am teaching remotely in another district. My daughter's in second grade. She cries daily. Um, remote learning is not for her. She does not have access to her teachers, her support system, um, in person, and there's something to be said for in-person learning at all grades, but especially second grade where they rely so heavily on that social interaction. Um, she desperately begs to attend school, so much so that she asked if she could stay up late so she could listen to tonight's meeting and hoped that it would be the night that she heard that her school was going to be back in person even for just a few days. Um, so I understand that COVID is a reality um, and that as educators, we're all doing the best that we can to provide equitable learning for our students, but it is absolutely impossible virtually. There are too many obstacles to overcome. Um, and I know I have a second grader who would love so desperately to get some type of information that she could see her friends and teachers two days a week tonight. Thanks again for all you guys are doing. Um, we are super impressed with District 58 remote learning, but at the same time, I need to stop sitting with my second grader crying every day because how desperately she misses school. Thanks, have a good night. My name is Kylie, and I'm calling about my daughter attending middle school in Downers Grove, District 58. Right now, I don't think it's a good idea that the kids return back to school because we have now a mutation that is evolving that doesn't matter if you're wearing a mask or washing your hands, you can still catch it. It's very, very contagious. Not only that, but when the kids return to school, they come back home and they bring whatever they caught or brought home back to their entire family. I don't think it's a good idea that we return yet until we figure this out much better than we've already had. This is Chris Hanley. I have a student at Herrick Middle School was wondering how the district is availing itself of the ESSER funds that are available from the federal government. Thank you. Um, hi, hello. My name is Carrie Swenson. My daughter is an eighth grader at Harris Middle School. Um, I've spoken at the high school meeting as well. I have older children, or older children, sorry. Um, these kids need to go back. My daughter is crying every other day. The frustration um, from our wonderful teachers is clearly apparent. Uh, there's no, you can't do band. Um, you can't, you know, learn a language math, every single subject, even though we have the best teachers in the world in District 58, this cannot continue. I am not exactly sure if we're waiting for a vaccine. Um, I understand you have guidelines to follow. Um, I've been on the phone with IDHP, DuPage Health Department. Um, I've spoken to very high up. can give you those names if you would like. They have all told me that one patient is counted multiple times in our numbers, as well as out-of-state college kids or residents that don't use um, the out-of-state address as their permanent address are also in our numbers. It's just wrong. You can only be a risk factor one time while you live in the community. You cannot be a risk factor two, three, four, five times that they're counting these numbers for 
nor can you be a risk factor if you're at school at ISU um, and using your your parents' DuPage number here. These kids are being harmed. They will take a long time to recover. Their daily headaches, there is crying. These kids need to be back. The science is showing this is not where the serious illness nor death rates are. School districts are doing it very successfully across the nation. We need to get back to school under no circumstances. People are leaving our community to go to Indiana, to go to other areas because of the lack of school, the lack of progress, the damaging social emotional effects that is taking place. We need to get back in school. Put pressure on IDPH. Tell them these metrics are wrong. Tell them how these kids will do anything, including standing on their head with a full hazmat suit on, singing Old McDonald Had a Farm. These kids will do whatever you ask them. They just want the simple basic right to actually get an education with their peers in school. As sad as society has come, that's all these kids want. It can be done. It can be done. So please consider letting these kids go back to school. Thank you. My name is Dennis Breyer. I have four children at Kingsley currently and one entering Kingsley for kindergarten next year. My comment is that my children are suffering psychologically from remote learning. How do you plan to address this? And can you give a certain timeline on a return to school so that we can decide whether or not to find an alternative option for my children to return? While I understand your concern, given the health and safety of the students, I'd please like you to address the psychological impacts on the children of continued remote learning. Thank you very much. My name is Jason. I am a Hillcrest parent. I just wanted to urge the board to reject the current proposal uh, because as it's been stated, the teachers are doing an amazing job. Um, they are currently in a, a great groove. The children are into uh, an excellent, solid routine, and the disruption to that routine outweighs the added value of two and a half hours of on-site education in a day, not to mention the disruption caused by the transition time now getting kids to and from school. So I don't believe that the administration has made any um, convincing argument that there's a value add here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Scott. Our school is Kingsley. We wanted to first thank everyone for all their hard work. The question we had was uh, students in the sixth grade taking advanced math, how will scheduling work with them for middle school? So if they're in the elementary school taking advanced math, they normally have a class in middle school. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Melissa, how are we looking on time? Good question. Um, what time did we come back? It was at 30 minutes. Yeah, so, so I do have a little more time allocated if there is any additional comments here in person. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, we do have some recommendations for action tonight. Uh, as always, we did have a, a standing item for board action for a return to learn plan for the 2021 school year. So is there a motion to approve the following hybrid models for a return to on-site learning as presented? First, preschool, a five day per week blended model with three sessions per day on-site and a fully remote option. For elementary, K through six, five days per week with a blended AM PM model with a fully remote option and for middle school a blended alternating day model for grade level cohorts with a fully remote option on the same eight period day schedule is there a motion so moved second okay 
Obviously, we've already had a lot of discussion on these tonight, but is there any discussion? I'll just ask a question that uh, a parent and teacher asked about uh, the choice to have middle school come back before the trimester ends. Dr. Russell, if you don't mind just addressing that and thinking about helping us understand what, when, you weigh the, when you weigh the choices, why make the transition now versus later? Um. Again, this is, um, and I understand where people's perspectives are coming from. It certainly wouldn't be my recommendation. Um, with my priority list that we approach this as a team, it's, it's prioritizing in-person instruction. And um, I would support what many of our parents shared about the mental health of our students and in, in, in wanting to get back. I, I do appreciate what everyone has shared about being in a routine, and, and, and there is a lot of validity to that. However, I, I just don't think we can ever replace in-person instruction with remote learning, albeit th there's a lot of really good things going on. My recommendation would be to shift to um, in-person as soon as you can because I, I, I think that the benefits um, to that outweigh uh, some of the other things that were brought up. But again, I do respect everybody's uh, uh, position on this and this is something where you know, good people can disagree. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Just other comments, discussion? One other quick comment just after kind of listening to all the all the public comments we heard tonight and kind of processing some of our discussion from earlier. Um, I just want to, first of all, start by, again, like a couple of other people have done tonight, um, acknowledging the hard work of everybody involved in this equation from administrators, staff, support staff, families, and students. Everyone here is putting forth in just <clears throat> astounding amount of effort to make this situation as successful as possible. Does that mean it's perfect? No. Does that mean it's great? No. Does that mean it's what anybody wants? No. But everyone is doing everything they can and putting their best effort towards making it work. And I think that's to be commended. And I think, like I said, that's, that's everybody included, parents, kids, staff, etc. It's definitely clear from all the comments we heard that, that people's frustration levels are kind of at an all-time high. Um, and even though I think remote learning is a lot better than it was in the spring, and it's a lot better than most people I think would have anticipated it would be coming into this scenario, it still is causing a lot of stress, again, for every single person involved. The teachers are feeling the stress, the administration is feeling the stress, the families, the kids, everyone is kind of reaching some sort of a breaking point on some level, I think, and it, it, that's challenging. I think in one way or another, everyone is kind of feeling that burden. Um, I just think it's important that, that we really work hard, and I think we've done so all along in, in through this process, but just to continue to, to come together with compassion and empathy for one another. Um, everyone just take a moment to, to always kind of keep front of mind and recognize that everyone is doing the best they can in this scenario. Um, and that if we kind of live by that motto of we're a community of people, you know, we talk about that a lot in Downers Grove and in District 58, that this is a community and, and we really kind of like put that word on paper and, and make it something important. And I think it has to be more than a word on paper. We have to live that and we have to act as a community and support each other through this totally unprecedented time that nobody's ever experienced before. Um, and I think keeping that idea of com being compassionate and being empathetic towards one another, moving forward in whatever model we're in at any given time is just hugely important. Um, I also think that the idea of consistency is going to be hugely important in whatever model we are in at the moment. I think we need to um, prioritize the idea that, that our, our students and our families and our staff um, thrive on that consistency and need that consistency. And I think moving forward, um, it seems like the various models and the, and the fluidity back and forth between them is, is attempting to provide that. And I think that's really important. So. I'd like to piggyback on what you said um, and acknowledge the blood, sweat, and tears of the administration, the teachers, most definitely, and even the parents rising to the occasion, and we're, we're all making lemonade out of a whole bunch bucket of lemons. Yep. So um, 
And I would ask the administration and the teachers to work towards flushing out more of that. You because they hit it out of the park so so awesome to start here. Um, I see concerns. I don't have a, a a foot in the door of the elementary anymore, but I think we need to really flush out what that afternoon or morning looks like for the kiddos when they're at home. It, it needs to be much more fleshed out, uh, and I'd like to hear that at the next meeting, um, how the, what that's gonna look like. And I'd also, um, for as much as a middle school parent, uh, for as much as I hate the cohort, um, I know that my son and many of his friends will do whatever it takes to get back in the building. and. It may look different, but I think having the kids in a room with however many kids throughout the day that they have to stay with is still better than laying on the floor of their bedroom with their switch, their phone, their Chromebook, their dog, their cat, and everything else distractions in their home that I know that kids would probably take school a lot more seriously um, at home and have or at school and have their needs met in the in the classroom than at home and so because I believe that so strongly that I will I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be understanding that that's just what it has to be so but I would like that flushed out as well like moving forward like if there are issues with it um, in the middle school I would I want to know about them absolutely Anything else? I do think it is important to acknowledge that, that there are deficiencies. I mean, we, we heard people brought up, uh, bring up very valid concerns, and, and I have them as well. Uh, and so this really came down to, to weighing two things. There's been a tremendous amount of work to make the flow of a remote learning day work, and I, I commend everybody who did that. Uh, and there is going to be challenges to having, in, in the elementary, uh, an asynchronous uh, time and synchronous time a little bit more separated. But I do see a tremendous amount of value in in-person learning, the impact that that's going to have on social, emotional, and also just the impact that, that a teacher can have and the relationship that they can build in person. So um, I, I did want to take a moment, though, because the concerns that people are bringing up are real. and. So I think with every, everything that we review, we've got to constantly just be taking a look at this and making sure that we're doing the, the most we possibly can uh, for our students. So uh, I appreciate Eyes wide it. open, uh, as Craig open. said. That's right. I What's like best it. for kids? Is that the slogan of this year? Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the following hybrid models for a return to on-site learning as presented. First, the preschool, a five-day-per-week blended model with three sessions per day on-site and a fully remote option. Two, the elementary, K through six, five days per week blended in AM-PM model with a fully remote option. And third, middle school, blending alternating day model for grade level cohorts with fully remote option on same eight period day schedule. Next up, we have a first reading of policies 2220, 2220-E9, 510, 5100, 5220, 5330, 710, 7180, 7185, 7340, and 7345. Is there a motion to approve these policies, 220, 220, E9, 510, 5100, 5220, 5330, 710, 7180, 7185, 7340, and 7345 as presented for first reading and place them on the October 14th, 2020 agenda for final approval? So moved. Second. All right, is there any discussion? I don't know uh, if Member Samante or... Mm. Member Weiner has any? Member Weiner. Again, this was um, carrying back how many, was it two policy meetings ago that we had? Yeah. This is, this is uh, the stuff that we talked about before that now it's for the first meeting. Yeah, so to just sum it up real quick, um, 
There were other uh, Title IX requirements that had to be passed right away to be in line with the new statute. Um, these do have to be passed to be in line with the new statute, but they are not as time sensitive as those other ones that need to be put in place. So these can go through the normal uh, reading. Is there any questions or discussion on these? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve policy 2 to 22 to 20. Dash E9, 510, 5100, 5220, 5330, 710, 7180, 7185, 7340, 7345. As presented for first reading and place them on the October 14th, 2020 agenda for final approval. We have some announcements, are uh, really only one. Wednesday, October 14th at 7 p.m. will be a regular board meeting right here at Village Hall. The board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion? To move to closed session to discuss the, the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the District 5 ILCS 122C1 and the placement of individual students in special education programs and other matters relating to individual students 5 ILCS 122C10. So moved. Second. Um, any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The board will now move into closed session. After a short recess, we'll meet at 11.10 p.m. The board has now returned to open session here at 11.31 p.m. And we have nothing to take action on tonight. So is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. <laughs> Second. Thank you. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannah. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. The meeting is adjourned here at 11.32 p.m.